I think you need to switch over. I think this light, this one, this light. but that light is okay. This one, no, now natural light is coming. Is okay. We have too many lights, but we don't know which one we need. Um, that clearly shows that our electrical engineering problem. When you design switch as an engineer, you always need to look at the convenience of the people, those who will be using it. Not for your convenience, the user convenience. The people, those are using it, if they are confused, then a new person will come, how the person will know that where which switch I have to switch on. You got the message? Okay. And all of you are university graduate or finishing it. If you are struggling, then a person with a lower level of knowledge, what that person will do? All right. Um, I think we can start. Recording on? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, good morning to you all again. Uh, we are in second day of our um, uh, beautiful uh, workshop uh, about vehicle um, aerodynamics. Uh, today we will be covering the aerodynamics of passenger vehicle, vehicle stability. Ooh, there are some problem. Hey, hey, stop recording. I think. It's coming. Is that? Is a power gone or something? Okay, all right. All right. We are in business now. So, good morning to you all. Um, let's go to start our second day of the workshop. Oh no, workshop, the short course. Uh, because sometimes we also call it workshop. Uh, it's a different country, different name, but essentially the same thing. So, our topic today will be passenger vehicle aerodynamics and vehicle stability, especially under the crosswind. And also, I'll be talking about wind noise, the noise that is generated by wind or interaction with the wind. Um, and then, uh, tomorrow, 
uh, we will be talking about how we measure the wind noise and also how we measure the aerodynamic forces moments and their moments um, using using experimentally uh, using the wind tunnel so i'll be talking about all these things tomorrow but today we will be giving you the major uh, things what are the things we need to do why we need to do um, and that sort of things so let's go to start our first uh, things that is the uh, aerodynamics of vehicles so what is all these things oh fine okay so vehicle aerodynamics as i said you briefly yesterday that it actually includes not only our road vehicles that you see on the road uh, particularly the car uh, the track buses uh, not only that but also buildings buildings and then uh, railways or trains particularly high speed train and and the train when you have a two train is crossing each other that is very important and then ships although although when um, naval architecture and marine engineering they do not look at very carefully about the wind load the reason is they look at predominantly hydrodynamic loads because hydrodynamic loads is 800 times more than the uh, wind wind loads but as you know nowadays the mini ship is a very big high above the sea level as a result wind load you cannot anymore anymore ignore uh, it is not only wind load the lateral stability but also another problem is uh, uh, chimney when the your smoke is coming from the chimney and you don't want that your passengers or the on board people actually inhale those uh, those um, those uh, uh, smoke so this is why it is also an important part but another interesting thing which i did not um, mention yet that particularly the defense or the or the navy ships or the like a frigate destroyer uh, they also have a helipad and those helipad need to be need to be also secured and checked that turbulence created by the wind is safe enough for the helicopter to 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 take off and land on the helipad of a of a ship so all these things need to be done otherwise for example if you use a, a frigate it usually cost around 200 to 250 million or 3 million uh, 300 million dollar and then you found that you cannot evacuate uh, your um, wounded or the sick people or the bring the people or some other supply emergency supply by helicopter to the to the ship so that is a very bad thing and uh, uh, we usually uh, do that testing in the wind tunnel as well so these are the main things we encompass our vehicle aerodynamics although vehicle it doesn't mean only the road vehicles anything moves on the surface and also not moving on the surface like our buildings and that is also important part so that's why you can see on the right hand side uh, just one second where is my okay so you can clearly see here is the building so in building aerodynamics we also need to look at the how the load is actually happening here on the top and also how it is distributed along the height and the second thing is um, um, that you when you when you construct the two buildings uh, side by side you need to have a certain distance between them and if you if you put two short distance between the two buildings high rise building then it will be natural wind tunnel there a big wind will be blowing there and that will have some other implication on 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 the surroundings okay that this is a very important thing as well uh, in addition to that the wind load if if you do not uh, carefully design the building without considering the wind load and wind profile then your ventilation problem also will be very high okay so that's another issue uh, we need to look at and as i said yesterday briefly that in building uh, you can find that the uh, the wind load can be on the top floor is so high that it can actually swing okay it can swing but uh, uh, for example taiwan 101 in taipei in um, in uh, former chinese uh, formosa there that uh, big building actually swing one meter one meter it swing it i think the 101 story building so uh, therefore they put a special pendulum damper on the top floor so that it actually when the wind uh, uh, the building want to swing that way and the pendulum is trying to put is opposite way so it is a very interesting thing um, in addition to that uh, that road vehicles road vehicles uh, is coming the train and the and the buses so we of course we look at that aerodynamic drag uh, at the side force and there are um, other corresponding forces and also moments uh, in addition to that most important thing is also the the cross cross flow of the wind 
and that is the biggest problem. I will talk, talk about that things a uh, little bit later today, uh, particularly not only the car and the track, but also the railway. When the goods train is moving, uh, sometimes the empty wagon can, can easily ro roll over or derail from the rail track. So, it is uh, you also need to take into account of that things. And in addition to that, uh, shifting I already told you, it is not only the drag, but also um, in uh, particularly particularly the sailboat particularly the sailboat uh, i'm not sure how many of you know that uh, that in um, in america and also in australia uh, we have a boat racing sailboat racing and the sail is very long very high so uh, that is purely with that sail the triangular shape you can actually you can actually sail in the same direction opposite direction of the wind as well uh, but of course there is a zigzag way you will do but we are not in a um, uh, enough time otherwise i would be more than happy to talk about how actually sail aerodynamics works so uh, in addition to that in addition to that uh, you have uh, there are some other recreational uh, the boats where you need to know your uh, aerodynamics how it works on the sail so that you can utilize it it's a maximum uh, maximum benefit you can utilize for your own uh, use so these are the things we look at and another thing is we also look at the hydrofoil um, the aerodynamics behavior because uh, very often we don't go to the water tunnel we also do in the wind wind tunnel and then we using Reynolds number similarity which i'll be talking uh, tomorrow when we do the experimental work uh, experimental work i'll be sharing with you at the time i'll be talking about that things so uh, using that we can also use it but one of the important thing is the whole objective of the aerodynamics not only train aerodynamics the most important thing is that you need to have a lower aerodynamic resistance that is our main business our whole target we need to set up that whatever we design as far as, far as when it interacts with the wind more than 30 km per hour we need to take into account the wind resistance if it, if it is 20 km per hour 10 km per hour wind resistance is not that significant at that speed remember that formula i showed you that um, half rho v uh, cube times the positive frontal area that formula so therefore a little little velocity does not affect significantly but a significant bigger velocity and then it is a to the power 3 it makes you absolutely miserable in terms of energy efficiency so this is why we need to take into account so our main objective is the any object we design be it a, be it a, a train or car or a track or a bus our objective will be that it is a low aerodynamic drag low aerodynamic resistance and then also for the vehicle and other things on the front and on the back we cannot make it absolutely uh, minimum minimum aerodynamic drag because we have some other limitation because in the front we need to have an opening uh, remember i told you yesterday that we need to have an opening for the air to come to the condenser and the radiator because you need to cool it uh, so therefore you cannot make it absolutely uh, closed then uh, uh, your um, you will be suffering your engine will be suffering from the cooling uh, the performance so therefore we need to have that opening but we need to have that opening such a way so that uh, we have a minimum aerodynamic resistance but at the same time we have also uh, not compromised significantly with the thermal cooling of our of our engine and other uh, other um, heating elements in the vehicle so that's why the word i used moderate okay if you look at very carefully the wording the, the other one I said low, but here I could also write low, but that low I did not say because I don't want to tell you which is absolutely impossible to achieve or you can achieve it, but it will significantly uh, affect the other, other, other performance. We don't want that. So this is why the word I wrote moderate and also I wrote, you see at the front and the rear, uh, we'll be talking about that things also today. And then of course, another thing is we don't want to have a significant um, noise aerodynamic noise now how many of you uh, actually drive a um, uh, car one two three four all oh, that is really good that many of you so when you drive your car say for example in a highway or or you have a most only freeway as well i, I know that one freeway between agra and delhi they have one uh, but i don't know whether you have a freeway it means where you drive 120 or 110 or 100 kilometer without any traffic light and unobstructed that is the freeway by definition because in freeway if you have a traffic light it is not a freeway it is already regulated so in on those circumstances if you drive your car all window closed everything is closed some roof closed 
and if you drive at say around around 80 km or 90 km per hour you will not be able to hear any more your engine noise you will not be able to hear your road tire interaction noise uh, you will not be able to hear surrounding noise you will be hearing only one noise that is wind rush noise we call it okay that wind rush noise is so big that you need to increase the volume of your tape recorder or, or not tape recorder, the audio or the or the usb whatever you have the um, music system or news uh, radio you are listening you need to increase the volume but otherwise you cannot hear it and that is coming from the wind and that initially for a short distance we call it uh, comfort because you cannot hear that's what we call comfort but if you drive a continuously for three to four or five hours then that noise will create a fatigue and that fatigue will make you tired and when you become tired your attention from the road will be diverted as a result as a result you can have a micro sleep and you have an accident when you drive a car at 100 and 110 km or 100 km per hour and you have microsecond you sleep and your road maybe band came and you are somewhere else and 100 km per hour how big impact will be so therefore wind noise initially for a short distance we call it is a comfort issue but a long a long drive we then it becomes a safety issue so please take into account of that initially comfort nobody cares about it but when it comes about the safety your regulatory authority is coming that it is not a good but on the other hand on the other hand if you can make very good ceiling so that noise from outside you cannot hear but that is not a good thing at all why because you need to have such a way your ceiling and your your um, your um, window so that emergency vehicle siren you can listen for example ambulance fire brigade emergency police vehicle you need to hear otherwise they will you will not have you will not give them away you will be driving in front of them and they cannot go so that is not a good thing so this is why this is the all regulatory requirement uh, of the car manufacturer they need to look at all these things very seriously and uh, car manufacturers who they are they are not a fellows alone it is all of us those are working there so they will be diverting the work the task on you they say hey, you fellows alone engineer uh, fix our problem you design this thing such a way so that we i our car when it goes to the market we don't have this problem clear to everyone so the problem will come to us it is not that managing director will solve the problem it is people like us those who are engineers and uh, uh, and the technologist and the science graduate we will be doing it so uh, you can clearly see these are the main our target in our aerodynamics so a lot of things a lot of things but the most important thing is vehicle aerodynamics it is it is not initially people actually looked at the car aerodynamics thing the main aerodynamics it's uh, it's experimental evaluation streamlined body uh, creation all this thing is done for aeronautical application for aircraft for missile or even before the uh, second world war there was no missile but they looked at the other projectiles cannon fire projectiles the other uh, different type of projectiles so uh, they looked at that things but they did not look at our road vehicles or train aerodynamics so if you look at in the in the web or, or in the uh, youtube or in the google you will search you will find before 1950 most of the vehicles road vehicles they are not a, a aerodynamic at all all are box, box type shape and everyone did the different way um, so this is all the important thing so so we inherited in our uh, in our vehicle aerodynamics all the knowledge that was initially developed for aircraft or some other vehicles and that knowledge we transfer to solve our ground vehicle problem and this is why i wrote these beautiful things here from aeronautical application to vehicle aerodynamics clear to everyone but we have a little problem here unfortunately anywhere in the world you cannot copy from something and immediately apply in your case without local contextualization you cannot do that so what i need to do because in aeronautical application all the aircraft very short time they are close to the ground during the takeoff and landing but once they are in the air 
they are outside of atmospheric boundary layer profile and also they are in a smooth air flow they are in smooth air flow again turbulence intensity is a very very low there extremely low although sometimes you have a little bit of bumping but that is the not all the time so and now if we use all these facilities all these um, the measurement techniques without local contextualization to our vehicle aerodynamics then we will make a lot of mistake a lot of error why because our car our truck our bus our train they are within the very close to the ground proximity around th they are or everyone they have either wheel or their or their bottom is around 300 meter above the ground and they are close to a lot of structure so wind profile close to all those structures is extremely volatile which i'll be showing you later and then very turbulent and the turbulence intensity around 2.5 percent so it is a very high and the wind tunnel that was developed for aircraft aircraft um, um, evaluation those are very smooth airflow so the result that you get from there and you want to use or that wind tunnel facility you want to use for your vehicle aerodynamics it will be significantly wrong significantly wrong so these are the things you need to adapt and in fact the people those who are using these things last 50 years or 60 years they modified all these things and adapted as much as possible for our real world condition but unfortunately till today we cannot replicate the true close to ground proximity atmospheric behavior and atmospheric characteristics in our wind tunnel or in the in the computation of fluid dynamics things because it is extremely difficult uh, those, those scenario so this is why this is why a lot of wind tunnel testing a lot of uh, on road testing happen and after that they make a compromise and that's how the, all the vehicle refinement at the at, uh, finally the ends there so this is the things you have to understand when you talk about the vehicle aerodynamics um, otherwise it is extremely uh, extremely misleading uh, information you will get from the wind tunnel so so let's go to show you just one second i think okay so this one uh, this is our schematic uh, things remember we have a uh, three forces acting on one is the drag force of course the longitudinal direction and then we have a, a lift force is upward or if it goes downward is a down force we also talked about briefly yesterday and then we have a side force and each of them will also create corresponding moments so if if it is moving in uh, if it is moving in relation to vertical axis that is called eo okay so in the uh, that's the one thing <laughs> in real in real real life wind can come from any direction your your vehicle doesn't need to move to the wind direction but in wind tunnel unfortunately we cannot change that so what we do we move the vehicle so i'll be talking about that things tomorrow more in details how we do it and and then of course we have also uh, pitching moment and then rolling moment so pitching moment is that why in relation to xs it is rotated like that clear to everyone like my hand if you look at there if this is a horizontal floor so when it is going like that that's called pitching moment clear to everyone and if it is rotating like that in relation to your x axis that is your rolling moment okay so this is all and their corresponding so what do we do uh, in the in the wind tunnel we actually measure all three all three uh, uh, three forces and three moments simultaneously simultaneously okay that is the things we have developed i will be talking that things how we do it what sort of sensor we are using uh, what are the equipment various wind tunnel uh, using to measure uh, that things uh, we'll talk tomorrow so but the question is here interesting thing you can look at very carefully in uh, here we have a little a and a is the projected frontal area so because in car uh, in road vehicles apart from train road vehicles be it a bus truck or car we have predominantly form or pressure drag Formal pressure drag it means what is it, its area it faces the wind very big area so that is uh, the form or pressure drag and uh, th therefore we need to know the car's projected frontal area when it is absolutely aligned with the wind direction not any eo angle or something it need to be zero zero eo angle with the wind and that is called projected 
uh, protected frontal area, but how we do? And that is the question number uh, one and also million dollar question. Okay, the how we get this A? Can we get this A very accurately? Ideally, ideally, we have to put a car on the against the wall and that will be projecting the light horizontally and those horizontal projection will go on the wall and they will make a little shadow and the area of that shadow is your positive frontal area okay i was involved only twice in my life only twice in my life how to determine the positive frontal area because we had a vehicle and we did not have a dimension correctly so therefore therefore we put against the wall and then we put a lot of light projection and then we found it and it, it took a little bit of time not even one day a couple of days because we need to integrate all the shadow to get the right positive frontal area and also we did a not only one single one me there are also a couple of other my uh, my fellow classmates classmates means my phd mates uh, we are doing together at the time phd so usually we do help uh, each other when we need hands so uh, this this is the, the one how we do it i show you in the next slide this is how we do okay now the work that i i am sharing with you today tomorrow yesterday and day after tomorrow this work is the actual work how you do in real life i am not telling you anything that you only do theoretically but never do in practice that is the things waiting for you if you are working in the auto industry they will do the exactly the same way but this technique the process you can also use in different other areas as well the philosophy is the same the methodology and approach is the same only instead of car it could be train or instead of train it could be a ball like a soccer ball i think you call football right in in the you know in australia we call soccer ball so or or a tennis ball or a cricket ball okay so next time when you go uh, home or to your office put in a google search firoz alam and cricket ball firoz alam and tennis ball firoz alam and soccer ball and see what are the things you find and tell me tomorrow day after tomorrow all right so that is little bit for your um, homework now so the you see the parallel, but now the question is to put the per light parallelly it is hard a little misalignment a small angle change your shadow will be slightly different isn't it and that is the very big challenge so uh, Wolf Hendis Hucho he actually came out with a very nice uh, formula he said okay if you are very busy you cannot do 100% accurately but at least close to then you use the a positive frontal area a equals 0.83 times the width of the vehicle and the height of the vehicle width of the vehicle and the height of the vehicle so now i'll show you next uh, uh, slide what is the height we are taking what is the width we are taking uh, which location unfortunately our car is not a very very rectangular uh, it has a little bit of carve and other things so uh, the another important thing you know, another important thing is that uh, height anyone can tell me is the height is the bigger or the width is bigger in the car generally are you sure young man <laughs> all right you measure next time you have a long tape so it is okay um, I, I attended a course but i want to i want to check my width is bigger or height is bigger generally generally width is bigger width is bigger generally um, uh, in an in a standard passenger car the car that i showed you on the other day uh, that that is a that is a standard that is a standard passenger car where five people can sit nobody touch their body other other person enough space in between clear to everyone so in the rear seat you have three people and three people sit such a way so that one person will not be touching other person that is the uh, we call family size standard passenger vehicle or passenger car and all other cars unfortunately squeezed uh, 
so in a standard passenger car width is around 1.5 1.5 to 1.6 meter and the height is around 1.4 1.45 meter all right so young man you check it at home see whether you are very close to it or not okay good man all right so so this is the these are the things why the why i asked that question to you the reason is remember you have a lane on the road the the marks marking of the lane the multiple lane you have a white white line so you need to set up the, the your lane standard such a way so that the most vehicle can fit within that lane clear to everyone it is not that i like here very small lane, narrow lane some are wide lane no it is a standard there is a based on that so it's very important uh, also to uh, know all right so this is the height you will be taking from the me uh, so, uh, you see the height from the top because you should not take from here should not take from here because it is a little bit of curve the roof is not absolutely flat it is curved so therefore you have to take height from here up to the up to up to the up to the wheel base up to the wheel base where wheel is touching the road surface and and the and the width is so what do you do if you want to measure very nicely you put a uh, some object here absolutely vertical on this side and also absolutely vertical on this side and then you measure that one that is your width all right now you understand how to use the formula very good okay so this is a this is a different car it is, it is just to give you some some uh, some understanding it is not exact value every country smaller car can vary a little bit of dimension all car one manufacturer to other manufacturer they are all are not the same dimensions so therefore it is just a representative to have to guide you to help you a little bit of understanding that oh okay my value will be close to it so this, this is how we are saying about that so these are the uh, different uh, mini 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 medium size upper size full size full size the car that i showed you yesterday my uh, my car 4000 cc one that one that is a full size car so that is the uh, protected frontal area around around 2.1 meter square um, and then another interesting graph uh, 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 mr hucho uh, not actually mr hucho professor hucho i sorry <laughs> uh, he actually showed some european car but please uh, you have to be a little bit careful with this graph because in europe they do not drive very big uh, large vehicle their cars are very small okay because uh, europeans they use they do not use like in uh, america or canada or australia because australian people they like a big big vehicle they do not want to buy a smaller vehicle even most of the time 19 95% 98% time only one person in the vehicle at any given time but still they like big big vehicle so uh, those vehicle this relationship will be slightly different slightly different so if you now uh, why it is important i tell you the reason is sometimes say for example um, say uh, suzuki or maruti maruti is producing a car and maruti wants to sell that car to australia so maruti cannot sell the car that it designed for for india that car cannot be sold without any modification to australia because first of all any vehicle manufacturer in the world doesn't matter who if they want to sell a car in australia they have to comply with the australian design rule for an information for you australian design rule the first design rule was in uh, the developed in 1948 and then 1973 we re revised the design in 50 60 years ahead thinking because we don't design we do not change the design rule very often but that design need to comply any vehicle and it complete uh, com uh, that com uh, compliance need to be done road testing and other testing in australian condition so this is why when you open the bonnet those who have a car there is a bin number vehicle identification number b i n vehicle identification number and that number you have a lot of big digit various word letters everything there and each of this letter has a meaning that it was designed for which condition for which country 
and uh, road condition all these things indicate there clear so therefore if you are working as an engineer in the company so if you want to sell it to australia you need to comply with australian design rule if you want to sell it uh, in america you need to apply american design rule if you sell it say other country if they have this any rule like that so you need to comply otherwise your vehicle will not be permitted or not given the registration to run on the road clear so this is why this is why i tell you that please do not do not blindly copy this particular relationship for every car because this was this was designed only for european cars and european cars is generally a little bit smaller car okay so that yeah, in this in this category mini and medium okay most cars in uh, this this category even less than 5% in europe okay uh, anyone can tell me why european use the smaller size car any idea okay the reason is first of all two things europe most of the europe's built up areas roads were built around long time ago roads are narrow that's the one thing so city fringe road are very difficult to negotiate and second thing is europe's in europe they put a heavy taxes on the fuel so they do not encourage people to use individual vehicle to move around they because their public transport is well developed so they ask people to use where possible the public transport but so they cannot force you other way so that's why they put the tax on the fuel is significantly high and as a result on the fuel pump the fuel price is much much higher than even the same fuel in australia or even in india clear so this is why this is why they use a smaller vehicle which consumes less fuel and also negotiate with the narrow road within the built up areas i'm not talking about the outside of the city that is not a problem because they already have a wide road no problem but within the city fringe remember that things so if ne next next time you think about it immediately know why this reason is uh, why they are having this car all right so uh, these things we already know now this how to use it and the formula on the other other uh, slide i showed you the the point 83 the projected frontal area if you do not have the facility to determine exact for, uh, frontal area of a vehicle in that case you use that formula a equals 0.83 times the width and the height of the vehicle that's so simple we don't need to worry about anything but it will be almost 98% correct and if 98% correct that is more than enough because anything you calculate anything you calculate on this planet you always apply safety factor and that is a minimum one you apply 25% so that 25% will cover your all the errors and everything clear okay all right now this is a chronology <laughs> box type i already mentioned briefly yesterday the box type um, uh, the the vehicle and then it's little bit of smooth on the side and then of course little bit so still you see from almost three can you believe it we will be bankrupt if we use that sort of vehicle now particularly people like me don't have enough money so that will be a problem okay so um, and also the environmentalist they will be they will be running after us they will say you are destroying our environment because you are burning a lot of fuel and co2 is coming so uh, this is the our our uh, area because you see the how the positive frontal area reduced drag coefficient reduced look at there from 0.642.29 okay more than half more than half it is a significant reduction and then also this is that uh, chronology uh, different year uh, they showed it but actually before uh, before the first world war and uh, and between second and first world war and immediately there but at that time it was not a mainstream thinking any manufacturer they want to do it they usually did it sometimes like a hobby sometimes like a hobby they tried okay see how it looks like but not for mass production mass production before second world war no mass produced streamline vehicle was done the first mass mass produced vehicle was 
Volkswagen Beetle, which I showed you yesterday. Remember that? That was the air cool, simple engine was in the back and the radiator on the front and that was really a beautiful car there. And now, and here of course, uh, we are not here since 1983, we are significant. I already showed you that graph as well. Remember that, uh, showed you that, uh, that uh, dependency where I said, okay, now you are, it is in your hand that you have to do how you go. Either you use underlying sti uh, underbody streamlining or you want to do platooning very close to vehicles or you use uh, electric vehicle or whatever it is. You need to do all these things uh, there. So, so, and this is ultimately every of these things. That is our main, as I said, our objective is to reduce the aerodynamic drag. So, the different way you can make, but here we have a little problem. The problem is, from aerodynamics point of view, we can make a shape so nice, it will have a very minimum drag. For example, I am not sure how many of you are familiar with the fish very well. There is a, a little fish you find in the water. That fish we call uh, puffer fish or the fish you take it out and then it pumps air and it becomes uh, very, very big, big fat. Okay, So it is called puffer fish. Uh, in Bengali we call potka fish. Potka it means balloon. No, it expands. So therefore, that fish and sometimes we also call in some country box fish. And that box fish actually we tested in our internet. Now you can say how can you me measure the aerodynamic drag of that tiny little fish. So what we did? We, we exploded the dimension and then we made a model. And you can also find in the, in the, in the open literature a, 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 a scientific article we published on that. And that shape we found that it has the minimum drag 0.1. That coefficient 0 0.C D equals uh, 0.1 we found. And that is like aircraft. But if that shape we ask to use for our commercial vehicle manufacturer, they will not do it. Why? Because it looks so ugly. People will not buy it. People will not buy it. As I told you, remember yesterday I told you that people always look when they buy a car or a motorcycle, they always look at how big, how beautiful it is, how looking it is, and then they decide whether they have enough money to buy it or not, isn't it? People, those who bought the car, they already know about that. They have a rough idea how much I need to pay for the car, but they did not decide based on that. They actually go to the car, uh, car show showroom, look at that things. If they like it and their family members say, yes, we want to have this color, this, uh, this shape, then they decide to buy it. And even if the money is a little bit more, they still get that money from someone else and still buy it. So these are the things. So that, that box fish or a papa fish shape, unfortunately we cannot use. So what are we are doing at the moment at RMIT? We are now modifying it. We are now making it a good shape. But when we want to, when we are adding good shape, unfortunately our drag coefficient is increasing now. It is not anymore point one. It is already increasing uh, significantly up. But our objective is to go not the more than the what is the existing one we want to be reduced so that is the way generally we go from aerodynamic point of view we start a simple shape and then we add the complexity to to replicate the model or the or the full scale vehicle very close to real one that is how we do in practical and now this is the process this is the process how we do you see this is our extreme, extremely low aerodynamic drag, correct? Because flow is parallel. Only the friction drag is mainly coming, very thin flat surface. And this is the extremely high aerodynamic drag because it has, its, its shape is so big, the form of pressure drag is so high. You can see that. Here is a very low and here is a very high. And this is your boundary. Young people, here is your boundary. You, can, you don't want to have this one, you don't want to have this one for your vehicle. You will be always in between. And how, how optimal you can go? Of course, your idea, ideally you want to be very close to it, correct? So you are now doing, we call reverse engineering. Your target is fixed. Now you are doing all this fine tuning of the body and then you are coming to 
in this area. So we are at the moment here somewhere. So we are actually most of the vehicle is somewhere here. Clear to everyone? And this picture uh, pictorially shows you where is your boundary, where you need to be. Like many many uh, periodic table. You know that you did in chemistry, uh, when you did high school chemistry, you have a periodic table of the elements and uh, that uh, table was compiled first uh, is a Dmitry Mendeleev, the Russian scientist from Moscow State University and then at that time he said, hey, hey, if you want to find this element at the moment we don't have in this world, but if you want to find that element had these features, characteristics and look at there, so they already, he already gave you the guideline where to look for, not everywhere, you look for so that you can quickly find it, exactly the same thing is a very similar to that that guideline is there that that is you cannot go there you cannot it is not possible to get so therefore you will be realistic somewhere here and and the slide that i showed you yesterday and young people we 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 are highly dependent on you how you will be leading us in the future okay but your objective will be go as close as possible but remember if we if we make our car in the back like that i i have a doubt at this moment people will buy car or not okay a ponytail a ponytail is on the back um, people will not be uh, very enthusiastic to buy so the car uh, you remember car uh, manufacturer they are making very little money from each car even the car dealer gets more money than actually the car manufacturer so therefore but why now you didn't ask me a good question yesterday that is if a car company is only making 1000 or 2000 dollar from each brand new car then how they survive i told you partial i i actually inform or told you the partial answer i did not give you the full answer yesterday i told you that they sell a, a lot of vehicles right so that is the partial answer of the question that you might have but they are making money from the spare parts they actually on average they make more money significantly more money than a brand new car selling to you yes because it is a, a, a vehicle has a lot of moving parts and not only moving parts because i saw when i came yesterday from um, the alabad airport to here the road condition it is falling here and there everyone is the whole vehicle looks like a struggling so as the vehicle is struggling, you know you engineer, I don't need to explain anything, your wear and tear will be high and if it is too much then it will break and when it is a wear and tear is too high and the brakes, at that time the car company is making money from you, clear? So of course they don't want to have a bad road, it is not their intention uh, but uh, unfortunately it is there, so that is how they do. So this is an important, so spare parts are the biggest business than upper service, we call it upper sales than the actually car and this is why car company don't want the car to be run on the road 20 years their main target is 10 years go buy a new car from us and american they actually did uh, chrysler ford and uh, general motors uh, in 19 in 19 uh, late 1920s uh, when the people start to buy less car then they bought 20,000 cars from american market and they dump it because so that people cannot anymore uh, have a old car to buy so they have to buy a 20,000, actually 20, 25,000 vehicles and it is a fact, I am not telling you uh, the wrong thing, okay, so this is but law does not permit, law does not prohibit it, so they did it, three car company, they combined together, team up and then they bought all the old cars from the market who want to sell and then they put it and they dump it somewhere and stamp it and put there, so that car is shot in the market so that people will be buying new car, there is no other way. But I don't know whether they can do it in India or not, but <laughs> that's the thing they did in America. Anyway, <laughs> so um, now when we have a shape in a real car, we have a, as, as you remember yesterday I showed you the flow around the vehicles, but there is a, a particular in the front of the vehicle is a very complicated. Front of the vehicle is a very complicated because there is a lot of different type of curvature, different type of shapes there and those are shown here in the magnifying here and you can see through this whole 
uh, there is a local flow separation there is a flow is going different away uh, and then it also creates a little bit of resistance as well and so these things you need to optimize such a way uh, so that your aerodynamic resistance is less so how they do it in real life uh, they usually make a clay model a clay model with the with the soil or similar material soft soil clear or soft uh, plastic uh, material so they make the model and then someone is like uh, like you know those are you know in our um, in indian subcontinent uh, during our religious things particularly our hindu religion things what do we do uh, we have a lot of statue right so a statue the people those are making the statue what they do they initially put the clay and then they uh, take out polish it and then it gives a nice shape right exactly the same thing it is being done in the clay model so they make a model in the in the industry and then they uh, started to polish it and then that model they put in the wind tunnel they get the they get the they get the right combination and after that they take the dimension uh, with the ferro's uh, they call ferro's arm with the ferro's arm you can get the dimension but now you also have a laser you can use the laser with the laser you can get the dimension i saw in uh, jilin university's wind tunnel they have a laser things they do not use ferro's ferro's arm but long time ago when i did my phd at that time we used ferro's arm to get the dimension from the model uh, to the real so that we can transfer it to cad uh, or the other solid works or some other computational tools uh, to develop the model so that's how we did from there so we develop a model and then model we polish and then we put in the wind tunnel when we found that our target is very close and at that time that dimension of that model we transfer uh, to the digitize, digitization uh, so that based on that we can make the full scale uh, vehicle that's how the process so to transfer from model to the real dimension we used to use ferro's arm ferro's arm the ferro's i think someone named he developed it so that's why in his honor is called ferro's arm but now uh, at the moment people use also laser system laser beam and with that they can get even more accurate data but ferro's arm it takes a little bit time it is time consuming okay when i did it took like three four five days and still we are not 100 percent sure that we got everything correctly or not so we have to do three four times to get the same data or not and once we got very close then it's okay fine now we go but in the laser one you can do many times very quickly and that one i saw last month in jilin university in in changchung uh, one of the largest wind tunnel uh, of, of china so that is our front and this epillar i'll be coming in a second because that is very important that is your radiator uh, things uh, unfortunately i don't have enough time otherwise i could actually talk about the, uh, the 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 optimization of the radiator opening with the grill grill opening about that so we'll see if time permits i will also also explain to you about that because these are the things all we did experimentally so it is uh, all in my little toy little things okay uh, but the another thing is the back the back is a very sensitive issue also because if your car as aesthetic is an important part of the vehicle you have a limitation you have a limitation so the different type of the shapes of the back has a slightly different drag and you need to come up with a good optimization and also 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 the customer perception as well and you cannot make all three shapes in uh, only one shape and sell in the market no the car company they also vary uh, they varied their shape size so that they see that if particular shape does not go very well in the market the other shape will at least uh, go to the market very well among the customer reception will be well and then they can make uh, they can uh, return their their, uh, their their money clear so this is why these are things they look at and now the standard i think someone told me yesterday that uh, in their uh, in their wind tunnel they have a uh, standard body called Ahmed body and uh, you told you yeah, young man I remember that Ahmed body is a standard body we use for optimization of various shapes of the of the vehicle and is a Saeed Ar Ahmed he is actually son of this country India uh, I don't know which part of India but he migrated long time ago to Germany and he worked with the old Fenris Hucho together uh, but I am not 100 percent sure that uh, Saeed, Ar, Saeed, Ar, Ar, Saeed Ar Ahmed I don't know Ar, what it stands for um, he whether he did a PhD under uh, Olf Hendrix Hucho or, or just he is a colleague of Olf Hendrix Hucho University of Brunswick in Germany, I don't know about that. But 
but I know these two people worked very closely and they published a lot of paper and the first book about road vehicle aerodynamics written in 1987 by Wolf Henry Zucho, the Said R. Ahmed names also there too. Okay, so, uh, but I met him in, 19, uh, in uh, 2001 in Detroit, Michigan in a conference. So, I am also a little bit of lucky man in that respect uh, to see him when I was just a postdoctoral research fellow at the time. So, um, that model all over the world, it is a standard model because a lot of data is available uh, of its optimization. So, all the people around the world, commercial or the research people, they use that model as a standard and they calibrate their own uh, the wind tunnel facilities which is here uh, okay i'll come uh, it's not uh, uh, not this one next one so uh, one important thing i wanted to say before i go to the optimization that in the car is a blood body what is the blood body blood body it, it means it it has a lot of flow separation or and also it has predominantly its drag is coming from form or pressure drag it is not streamlined because if the body is very streamlined then the drag will be skin, skin friction drag but as a car unfortunately it is not a blob body and we cannot make a so because this angle is a 60 degree from vertical we cannot put less than that because otherwise you will be hitting uh, the window those who are sitting here ok so if you uh, 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 if any one of you have time you can uh, you can borrow my PhD thesis which I finished in uh, uh, year 2000 um, and actually I put a data on the, at, at least 60 different vehicles I measured the production vehicles brand new production vehicles at the time 1998 and 1997 uh, I, I measured what is the angle here most of the passenger vehicle ok that data compiled in that PhD thesis as well so any one of you interested you are most welcome to borrow that uh, thesis from RMIT library it is for everyone is open from all over the world uh, you can get and the data from there so that is my own uh, my, my own work which I have done so so around 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 90% uh, uh, drag is coming from form or pressure drag from the car skin friction drag is the less than 10% in the car as a rule of thumb so uh, the uh, form or pressure drag you are getting from within that formula as you know and this one you need to this formula you need to use for skin friction drag and this uh, powerpoint presentation like yesterday you all of you will be getting and then this formula also you can use there is a little bit of example i have also put here how we will be calculating all these things and you can use it uh, as a little guideline for you if you are involved with this uh, in the future or now uh, you can use that uh, guideline okay so i don't want to go very detail about this very very all this dimension is shown here and how we are using it because s is the surface effective surface area a is the positive frontal area all right so uh, you can use at home uh, as a guideline and now we are going to that Ahmed body as uh, this young man mentioned to me this is the Ahmed standard body and of course the different um, angle and the, the front edge uh, you can plot this graph and you not necessarily your graph will be exactly the same but it will be very close it will be very close and then once you see your 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 graph is very close to it you know that you are doing the right thing and now you can modify and do your more adventurous thing that you want to do because you always need to make sure that your calibration is done, done correctly and thereafter you do your modification break for photography now ok all right. so uh, is it clear to everyone so this uh, particularly those who are doing road vehicle aerodynamics particularly car or okay, passenger car aerodynamics Ahmed body is a benchmark it is your benchmark and we always do in our winter as well we have couple of Ahmed body and we always ask our student whenever they do any experiment the first you look at this and then you do your more adventurous things ok so with this note I stop for a while uh, because we have a, a beautiful photo session now isn't it alright ok so we will come back after the photo session and also we will have a little tea break
on the particular Tommy Hill figure doesn't help. All right, let's go to start, young people. Okay, so about Ahmed Bodhi, you understand, we sometimes we call it a little Bible. So, because it's a reference point, uh, so that our young people, when they, not only young people, any researchers, when they do any uh, research, they always need to calibrate against it. Similarly, as you know, those who are doing experimental fluid mechanics, they always, uh, the sphere, their experimental setup, a, BR, a, a smooth sphere, they put in the uh, force sensor first, uh, then they compare it with uh, the data that is published in 1960s. Uh, somewhere in Imperial College and, and so on. So, this is the normal rule and then they do this. Uh, it is always important. I will also show you later, uh, later either today or tomorrow that when you do this calibration, it is uh, not only do, it is essential that you do calibration when particularly you measure the noise uh, with the microphone or electronic devices. It is very important there. All right. So, in addition to vehicle itself, very often you will also find the vehicle also have some add-on. Add-on, it means some spoiler, some roof rack, uh, and also some, some people have, uh, in Australia, many people also have boating, uh, kayaking. So the kayak, so what they do from home, they put on the top of the car, and then they go to the near uh, water place or water uh, location, and then they, uh, they take it out, and then they do the sports thing, and then come back, bring it back. So all these things, also can add up, add up uh, your aerodynamic, aerodynamic things. Anything you add on the vehicle, as simple as it is, as a rule of thumb, anything you add that will generate extra aerodynamic resistance, as simple as it is. Whether you like it or not, that's a different thing, but it will. So, when you don't need it, that add-on, take it out. So, this is why in many, many um, car manufacturers, they always do all this add on such a way so that you when you do not need it, you can easily dismantle and you put it back. Okay, So, um, but here is the old thing. There are a lot of other things you have also the for example, sunroof. You know that uh, I am not sure in India you definitely have some vehicles, they have a sunroof and uh, sunroof also create if it is not closed, it will have an extra aerodynamic resistance because there will be there will be some, um, some because it will be considered as a, as a cavity, flow will come and recirculate, that will create a resistance. So, these are the things also. Now, and I draw your attention on one important thing uh, in Europe. In Europe, Europe is not only UK, because in our, um, our, our uh, colonial country, like, like we are, uh, where ruled by Britain, we think uh, Europe, it means in, uh, in a UK and Ireland. No, because they are. Uh, isolated island country. They are not actually main, mainland Europe. They are separated. So the Europe is other country. Of course, they are UK also part of the Europe. I am not saying they are not, but they are not the mainstream European. So therefore in Europe, regardless which country you go, they usually do not write decimal point in a dot. They write comma. Okay, so therefore please take a note. It is a not a comma, it is a point three four. Because the comma is for Europe, it is a dot, decimal point. Okay, because as some of you don't know, my bachelor's and master's I did in Europe. So I know exactly what they, uh, this all the sign convention is. Okay, so, so, uh, so I, for me not confusion, but some of you will have a confusion that what is that comma means. It is a dot point or it is something else. So that's why I'm mentioning to you. So this is uh, some um, basic configuration and when you add them up, as you, you, you can have some Although, uh, I draw your attention, many young people, many young drivers, you will find that they have a spoiler on the back, a little, a little spoiler on the, on, the, on, the, on the back of the vehicle, but there is, no, I, at least in our wind tunnel, we found that not a single spoiler actually in decrease the aerodynamic drag, or, or, but yes, there are some spoiler is effective on the racing vehicle, not the commercial vehicle. Clear to everyone? In the racing vehicle, spoiler is important, particularly when they are cornering. Because when they are cornering, they need to have a huge grip, downward force to the surface, so that they will not 
is uh, skid sideway clear because they want to go very high speed and then corner like that clear and that is the main reason they do so have a grip all right so uh, this is the windshield I will not talk a lot about that because uh, this is a little baby I have done a lot of things in my PhD thesis which I'll be sharing with you tomorrow uh, and I, at that time I'll be take, uh, taking you all these things and you just look at there this this picture old friend is Hucho wrote in 1998 and 1999 I did my 90, also 98 I also did a lot of work and at that time I did that things as well but I did not only the schematic here I also did a smoke I also did it with the ultap and I'll be sharing all those pictures with you and how nice they look at at different EO angles I'll, I'll share you in our winter we did tomorrow so at the moment I don't want to say so this is called usually structural joint of the uh, of the wind screen and the side window that is called a pillar middle one is the B pillar and so on I'll so this is your a pillar remember that angle I, sh I said to you that angle is a 60 degree generally generally but this angle it is not all the way same because the, your wind screen is a three dimensional it is not a two dimensional it is all of you remember my I, I, how I'm showing your wind screen is going this way curve and then this way also curve like that so that's why this wind screen is a three dimensional and also is a top end so that if it is any any um, any stone or any projectile hits you so that it does not immediately break down uh, so that no debris can fall on you so this is why it is toughened uh, it has a special laminated things on the top on the front and on the back so that it will shatter but it will not be completely become uh, broken clear to everyone and that's why the wind screen wind screen wind screen uh, manufacturing wind screen it need a good technological um, uh, technological know-how it is not that everyone can make three-dimensional glass shape it's very important so that's why when you look at your car those who have look at there on the side it is written who is manufacturing company actually it is not the car company someone else made it there is a name there okay all right so so uh, we'll be talking about that things tomorrow more in details uh, i'll show you different uh, uh, both uh, pressure static pressure dynamic pressure and also noise how you measure and i'll also, also show you flow visualization and then this is a lot of uh, things here a lot of things here uh, because some of these things particularly for this one it is uh, in australia and also in america and europe uh, and i'm not sure in india maybe also some people do they 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 are a very uh, sporty people sporty people it means to participate and to do the sports not to watch the sports a nation which people only watch the sports it is not a sporty sports a sporty nation a sporty nation is when you participate in the sports yourself clear to everyone because you then uh, you are recreational uh, sportsman or a sports uh, lady or woman and also you it's you are involved with the sports but when you watch it no it is uh, it is it is you are just a viewer you are a viewer you are actually not a sporty uh, nation so in australia uh, our people um, the people are sporty doesn't matter who which profession they do some sort of sports so some those who do not do any uh, cricket or football or or a rugby ball or tennis they usually go with the bicycling so every one of us we have at least uh, more number of bicycle than the actual our people at home so so what that we do very often we put the bicycle here and we go especially where there no no traffic and no other vehicle uh, no uh, big vehicles and a special uh, area and then where we do biking we take out the car, uh, bicycle from the top and then uh, do uh, do the, these things but uh, when i had my first car uh, i did not have a roof tax so i have to dismantle every time the bicycle i have to i have to dismantle disassemble and then i put in the car and then when i go there i assemble it again all right but unfortunately not everyone is doing that because sometimes they do not have a know-how uh, how to do it so this is very important so these are the different shapes and at RMIT University we did every possible way and we also published you can find all the uh, literature is there we also did you know if you see here in a countryside when you go you will find that on the bus sometimes they put a uh, the fuel the drum uh, the barrel we also did all these things because in Asian countries they do that things 
So we tried uh, that how much fuel actually uh, you need extra to, to, to carry that things. So uh, these are the things you need to look at. But remember as a rule of thumb, any, any add-on you put on the vehicles that will increase your aerodynamic resistance. Even the taxi driver, taxi, you know, the taxi vehicle, they have a, uh, a beautiful advertisement on the top. And you need to calculate the how much money you are getting from the advertising company because of carrying that advertisement. But actually how much money you are actually burning the fuel. Because you, whether you are burning more fuel, the money, the cost, then the, you are getting the money from the company. Then you need to check also. Otherwise, it is a waste of your uh, valuable capital, valuable um, uh, the uh, expenditure operating cost. So this is the things you need to look at. Uh, it is very important. No, unfortunately, all those work is a very complicated airflow around it. Uh, therefore, you need to do um, reliability by experiment. Uh, that is the way at the moment. You can do nice picture and you can have some preliminary idea using computation of fluid dynamics. But at the end, you need to do the wind tunnel testing, whatever you do uh, in your uh, in your uh, validation for that. Or you can validate on published data if someone did the experimental work and you compare that. So you don't necessarily need to you do by yourself. You can also look at that. So these are the things here. and. Now, this is a one uh, simple way we usually do a lot in the wind tunnel, uh, in our automatic industrial wind tunnel, with the smoke flow, flow visualization to see how the flow is behaving around it. Because air we cannot see in, with our naked eyes. So, we need to visualize air, the, how the trail of the air is going. So, this is one of the uh, method is smoke, and this is smoke is um, very low speed. We cannot do it high speed because if it is around 10 kilometer per hour, 10, 8, 6 kilometer per hour because if you do more than that when this uh, that smoke disappears with the wind very quickly you will not be able to see the trail nicely that's the one thing the other thing is that when you do with the smoke in the wind tunnel you have to do very quickly the first 10 15 minutes you have to finish all the photography thereafter your wind will be all with the smoky and hardly you can see very nicely anything and that is another problem so, if you are involved with that sort of research or will be in the research in the future, think about it. And same way you can visualize other things as well. And most of all you remember yesterday I showed you a graph, one of the, our cyclist, he is one of, one of our students. He is also a, a very good cyclist. So, he, he said, ah, no, I want to be in the wind tunnel and put the flow around me. Usually we do not do the light person. But he was so over enthusiastic, uh, we could not stop him. So that's you saw the trail of the flow, how it's going. So sa that same process we also do. And this is a, it is essentially the same thing, not a new things. And uh, this is the, the flow here. Usually it is that sort of flow is, uh, uh, this is smoke injected from a rack. A rack has a lot of nozzle. Clear to everyone? So for example, you consider this is a rack, vertical rack. And there is a lot of nozzle and through the nozzle is going the smoke. And that's why it shows a different one, two, three, something like that. But our objective is not that. Our, our objective is to see the trail, how the flow bends around it. So this is how we do the shape optimization of a vehicle. Now, as a rule of thumb, I also must share with you that usually <laughs> Usually, the car company, they, they always keep eyes. What are the vehicles their competitors are selling in the market? As a rule of thumb. Uh, you understand rule of thumb, it means must, they do. So what they do, they, as I saw it, that's why I'm sharing that knowledge. Uh, some people may not tell you that. So what they do, one car company, they want to make their new model, which definitely they want better than existing model. So therefore what they do, they go take a car, their competitors, which is a good one, they put in the wind tunnel, they study that car's aerodynamic behavior, not their own, their own they already know. They are competitors, competitors one. And then they do the benchmark against their existing one. And then they think, okay, I need to supersede of that car. 
so that I can have a competitive edge. So this is how they start. I am not sure how in India or Indian car company they do that things or not, but at least, at least other car company, I don't want to name because it's recording otherwise I would say uh, that's a problem. Uh, this is how they do. And I was involved because as I, uh, my uh, whole work is coming from experimental background and um, in, I was involved with many of these car testing. And I don't want to say which company, but they usually do one uh, others. So, and that is the best, that is the first thing they do. First thing they do, if say four or five car, the best one in the moment in the market, other company, they all of them they will bring. They will bring. They get it from. They don't go to that company. They actually get it from the dealer or somewhere else through their own network because the car company will not give other car company to test their vehicle remember it, so that's the, the, how they do and then they do the benchmark and then they start okay we need to we need to supersede that quality and from that the all all that because this all this testing what i said to you it is being done it is being done all full engineer not technician not a diploma engineer all bachelor degree and above they are the main driver when they put in the wind tunnel clear to everyone so people like you are the main driving force because you are making the decision for a car company millions of millions of millions of dollar uh, decision and it need to become very highly qualified people like you not from other persons because a car company cannot invest on that okay it need to be very authentic so this is the optimization thing done and this is the process how we do very simple shape simple shape again re to recap quickly very simple model and then we gradually make it more nicer 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 and come to the realistic one or that we think that our customer will perceive nicely now again if you are working in the aircraft industry you, you don't need to worry about that your objective is to as as minimum drag coefficient as possible that is your objective there and also the safety the, the aircraft safety so that structural safety and other things because you are not worry about the customers customers those who buy that aircraft they do not look at how it's shaped they look at how efficient fuel is and how safe the aircraft is and how many people they can carry and how many takeoff weight they can carry so because the more takeoff take off weight they can carry they can put people and also goods and also accompanied unaccompanied luggage and you know indigo if 15 more than 15 kilo you have to pay a lot of money so this is how they make money as an example i'm giving you indigo but they're all 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 aircraft companies they are making money usually as a rule of thumb the one percent of the first class passengers uh, ticket is your per kilogram that's the rule so it's very expensive so now this is how we go but our car unfortunately young people your hands are very tight you are your your hands are not uh, free like our air aircraft engineer you, if you are working in the auto industry your you have to go personal the customer perception first and from there you have to do back calculation but you are of course conflicting your interest but you go from here as practical as possible that's why i don't want to put you in highest uh, point as practical as reasonably as possible clear because you need to your car need to be sold and your profit margin is very small and a big number all right so these are the main way we do but how we measure in the wind tunnel what are the tools we use what type of wind tunnel we are using i'll be talking about that things tomorrow the different type of wind tunnel facility around the world they have we'll be talking about that things the real experimental thing how we do And now we are coming to the biggest problem of the car and the and the road and the bus and the truck is that on the crosswind. When the windy condition, it is not only windy condition, because any road on the highway, you will find that there are some roadside structure around it. It is not only a absolutely flat like our wall, like our floor, not like that. So therefore, when the wind comes towards you, it is highly, highly complex flow. 
it has a bit different level of turbulence it is coming a lot of uh, gustiness can be also the short time burst and therefore and also it is close to the ground proximity therefore a boundary layer is a very complex and unfortunately most most passenger car height is around remember i told you 1.4 1.5 meter and we do not have anywhere in the world any any reliable data of the wind characteristics at that height anywhere in the world doesn't matter where yes we have 20 meter above the ground 30 meter above the ground we have some data 10 meter above the ground but our even double stack container wagon its height is maximum 7 meter so it doesn't even cover that 10 meter it's still 3 meter short clear to everyone so this is our challenge we engineer anywhere in the world we need to face that dilemma but we cannot say we cannot solve it we always need to find a compromise so that it is getting something right so therefore the and another problem is when you drive the car on a on a slope up hill slope and sometimes your you are driving car and all of a sudden there is a little gentle hill and then on the top of the because when wind is wind is ramping up on the on on the ramp of the hill or a mountain it speeds can be more than in some cases we actually measure up to 60 60% more so if a uh, without ramp in the flat in the horizontal surface is say 100 km per hour but on the ramp the wind speed will be 160 150 km per hour clear to everyone and then this wind is coming like that and on the on the top section of your car all of a sudden the wind is hitting and that is a very big problem because your car can easily roll over and this is an important but particularly when it is not fully loaded but if you, if you have all five people maybe will not fall immediately but if you are a single person you may this is another important thing so this is why the crosswind thing you see the wind can come from any direction the worst direction is of course from the side 90 degree but in generally as a rule of thumb we never come at 90 degree because if your vehicle is moving so therefore angle will be different angle will be different and this is the things you need to take into account in industry in the wind tunnel unfortunately uh, this uh, two velocity one is the, our car speed another wind speed and the relative velocity is here the combined velocity or resultant velocity and that velocity in the wind tunnel we do not have the wind on this side so what do we do we just move the move the move the vehicle in different angle to the oncoming wind oncoming wind so that's the things we do but generally as a rule of thumb uh, you need to do the the crosswind effect on road testing on road testing and there is a designated area in the probing ground probing ground it means testing ground every car company in the world they have a little little uh, designated area like a big uh, closed area that usually don't allow you to go there because they don't want to tell you what are the things they are doing uh, so they have a testing area and those testing area they have uh, both crosswind test they have ramp test because sometimes you go on the ramp so that you how whether you skid or not and then they also have air conditioning loading test so they 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 put a special um, uh, the situation that outside temperature is a very high and they put the high volume uh, uh, the highest uh, option of the air conditioning and they check how long the air conditioning can survive with that and how long it takes to make the in ca uh, cabin make it cooler to a tolerable high temperature all this testing is done there and i am sharing this knowledge with you because i was involved with many of these things um, i was directly involved many many of the things i was observer i was observer because my phd when i was doing uh, as i said to you my second supervisor was the chief aerodynamics uh, the aerodynamicist of ford motor company of australia mr clive humphrey i am very grateful to him and he gave me unprecedented access to many of these things which i supposed to not to see okay so that's the things and as i had the access i saw it and i am sharing that knowledge with you so that you already have some idea how they do it okay so this is the situation so we need to look at uh, this and based on that another most important thing is we also need to calculate 
the average drag of a of a car based on the wind direction wind magnitude the car velocity and the wind angle over a a big spectrum and then we need to make an average and that average is called wind average drag wind average drag and that is the right in um, in australia or in, Aus in in indian subcontinent or some maybe in china i'm not sure or japan uh, they do not say what is the drag coefficient of the car but in germany if you want to sell a car you need to tell what is the drag coefficient of a car so that our customer can understand that this car is a fuel efficient in terms of aerodynamics point of view clear to everyone so some some country in australia it is not a requirement so the car company never say what is the drag coefficient is so you need to uh, explore separately so therefore you as an engineer you always need to do the drag, wind average drag based on different wind speeds based on the data also that wind statistical data you need to have and if when you do the wind average drag you also need to take the good reliable statistical data of the wind and that data unfortunately will not be the same in Allahabad compared to say Calcutta or say uh, Bangalore or say uh, Bombay you it will not be the same clear so therefore young people if uh, your car someone says is fuel efficiency is that they will argue with you no we did our based on our things but your situation is different so therefore your fuel consumption is higher and you cannot argue with them because te te technically they are correct that's the things so why this complexity is coming when we talk about wind average drag it is because of this situation now the atmospheric boundary layer condition and the and the and the wind uh, statistical data it is not it is not initially people thought in 1960s it is not they thought for our car or not for wind turbine you know that wind turbine is using for power generation it was not but most developed country and the western country they 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 develop their wind statistical data and wind rosette wind rosette it means the either eight eight direction of 360 degree or 16 direction 16 direction it means 22.5 degree each of there and 8 it means uh, 45 degree <laughs> you go like that okay 360 degrees so now what they do they measure the wind direction at least at minimum is a one year requirement but i believe that three or five years is a good data then that and they measure which direction is the wind coming most of the time and how many how many times that is speed in the direction based on that they developed wind rosette it means look like a rose flower so that's why it's called wind rosette data and that data that data they used not for wind turbine not for car uh, wind average drag they initially did they actually developed to develop the building construction standard clear to everyone building construction standard and now you can say professor Firoz what the th why we need it because the wind condition in Allahabad and the direction of the wind coming to the Allahabad not may not be the same in say somewhere in uh, in, in in Ahmedabad or Surat or or say uh, what is called that uh, Pune it will be different so if you use the same standard for Pune and Ahmedabad it will may not be the same so either you will be reinforcing you will be using a lot of more materials to make it strong or you will be under reinforcing clear to everyone so this is why and also the high risk building and that's why the building uh, the wind statistical data they developed country they did in Australia did in 1960 before my I was born uh, at least two three years before I was born at the time and they did it there but now luckily we we found a gold what is that gold we are using that data for wind turbine where we want to put our wind turbine clear to everyone now and of course unfortunately we cannot use for car because that data is uh, is uh, not uh, close to ground proximity it is uh, it is several 25 minutes above the ground so we cannot use for our purpose 
But our purpose, what do we do? We use a while inter, uh, uh, extrapolation or interpo interpolation between that. And therefore, our uh, estimation of the, uh, of the drag, unfortunately, it is not 100% correct. But that's the only best thing we can do at this moment. So you young people, you see, there are a lot of things still left for you to in discover. And this is another thing, if you can think that which way we can get very good statistical data of the wind condition close to the ground proximity, starting from say maybe one meter up to say up to say uh, two, three, four meter, and that will or maybe up to six meter. Then it will also cover the train and the double stack container wagon in the goods train. Uh, that will cover. So if you can do that, will be a great help for our for our human community all around, all around the world. Not only our India, but also for other country, other part of the world, because we are a global family in the world. Everyone uh, have the same right to share the knowledge as we. Okay, so this is the things as you can see the boundary layer in the city, the high rise building here, like our uh, say in uh, Noida or uh, Gurgaon. I think there is a lot of high rise building there, correct? In uh, in Delhi. So they are they are they are will be very very similar to this one, very similar to this one, and then. If you maybe Allahabad will be something like that, but little bit not 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 exactly like that. It will be very in between these two. In between these two, and if you go in the countryside, uh, in the in the village side, uh, then it will be very similar to this one. Okay, and then if you are exa exactly on the grass and trees, then the boundary layer you can see that you see point eight of the exact normal un un unspeed. So the boundary layer, the whole purpose is whole purpose is here. Uh, you want anything up to that level because that wind is very predictable you don't want in this area transition area because then you are not getting the full strength of the of the wind things okay so your calculation and other things will be uh, and also remember it is a very smooth car but actually in real life it is not smooth it is a fluctuating it is very fluctuating but of course it looks like a very nice car you think oh it is a very smooth actually it is not it is fluctuating like that so this is the problem so this is why at this moment, although it is a little bit um, not relevant to our course, but uh, in, in this area, that's why the most of the wind turbine, they do not put in this area, in this area, they put all the rural area. Clear to everyone now? Why the wind turbine we put, wind turbine to generate electricity? We don't like it here. We don't like here, we don't like here. We want to put here because we can see at a certain height, maybe up to 30, 40, 50 meter above, we can have a reliably uh, up, up very close to the the influence outside of the influence of the atmospheric boundary layer. Clear to everyone? And ideally, ideally that is much better in the sea level, in the water. So that is another things the wind turbine people are want to go in the future, but that is more expensive, 60 percent more expensive than the the wind turbine to build and to get the power on the land based. So that is the problem. So now uh, I already explained this one to you. Um, this is the problem where you have a, that sort of uh, ramp and the wind but here this uh, little formula they developed here uh, if you do not have the facility facility to measure uh, then you do it but in our case whenever we did our testing we always measured the flow first even on the roadside we never took any 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 of this formula for granted that formula is a good but we always measured the wind by ourselves we wanted to make sure that we are getting the right thing and, and as a rule of thumb engineers should not should not believe some other people data unless they cross checked unless they cross checked please take a note of that an engineer should not believe someone else's data if it is not cross checked because if what happened if someone made a mistake clear all right now i think uh, our tea is not coming all right we continue so and uh, there is some gap also in between this some belly can be not only all the belly is upward there could be also downward as well remember that that's another important thing and the air gap between this you can see there is a little tornado here and wind is going this way and that is anyone can tell me from aeronautical uh, what is they call when the wind is going downward to the close to the close to the ground 
down wash yes and down wash is a very dangerous thing for an aircraft and helicopter and many accident happen because of the down wash because you don't have when you are very close to the ground you don't have enough reaction time to go away from it and you don't want to fall into that if it is a very high then you still you can have a little bit of time and go go away but for this sort of things very dangerous thing and now i show you a little bit of statistical data statistical data that is it is 50 years value of two second maximum wind gust in one of the region in northern germany look at there how beautifully they measure it i i i wish i can do it everywhere in the world i wish i can or we can do everywhere in the world then we can design many things more effectively than these things yes t is already here oh we are more than happy yes please all right uh, young people will have a tea first and then we'll start because some of you i see already falling asleep
uh, is it on? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's go to start. Everyone is back. Okay. So uh, this graph, uh, I think there are important information is missing on the top. Uh, this is a, this is a wind gustiness measurement statistical data of a northern area of Germany. But it was done of an area at that time, East Germany was not a part of West Germany. Now is the United Germany, you know. Okay. So that is not important thing, but it's still, still data is valid. It is measured about 10 meter above the ground. And that vital information is missing on the heading here. But when you will get this information today, tonight, you will have that one. There. Yeah. So remember, it is a that is the in my knowledge in my knowledge we do not have less than 10 meter close to the ground any statistical data for a big area even till today we have a small point or two point but based on that we cannot take a final decision that in other area will be the same close to it that is our limitation at this moment so what they did, uh, they put they put a different location and uh, the weather station. And this weather station usually they monitor temperature, they monitor atmospheric pressure, they monitor the wind speed, uh, wind direction, and wind gustiness, and then also it measured the the humidity. So these are the data. I believe when they did this measurement with a multiple weather station, not multiple, maybe at least thousands of them they used. At that time, they could not get the data automatically transferred to the base station wirelessly because at that time this facility was not available. So they did manually, locally recorded or something they did and monitored and from there they collected the data but nowadays with the weather station you do not need to be individual weather station to check every time unless it is not working that's a different thing so you can get the data automatically uh, through the through the your wireless system you get it back so this is the facility at the moment what they do so what they did the wind gustiness uh, uh, the do you understand what is the wind gustiness it is the sudden wind uh, 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 outburst and that outburst does not last for long it is a very short time so what they did in this um, for 50 years data not one year 50 years continuously they measured uh, only they recorded for two seconds after two seconds they did not uh, measure it so that two second gustiness based on that data and a different differ and then this each of this line shows the train this al along this line they found that is a 52 meter per second some other line for for example this one as you can see it changes at different location so this is how based on each of the weather uh, station they compiled the data and they plotted the graph and i believe at that time there was no excel either <laughs> so they all did based on a cartesian coordinate system and then they put all the point and then corrected all the point nicely that is how they did but of course when you will be doing if you need to that you will be using now our all available technology and your life will be significantly easier than those people who did for us long long time ago clear everyone so this data how we are getting it at different location you can see each number indicate what was the 50 years average gustiness each number you see the different number 40 38 somewhere 45 somewhere a little bit more somewhere a little bit less all this number shows the meter per second the two second maximum two second data 50 years average it is not one or two years because if you do one or two years then sometimes it could be very high sometimes it could be very low so when you take a, over 50 years data that is more mathematically uh, more accurate data over a, of course it does not take the variation of the 
uh, to big n uh, to uh, small one because that's the gap will be remain there. Clear to everyone? But unfortunately, as I said, when I when I read in 1998 when the Hucho wrote uh, uh, this publication came out, when I saw, I was at the time uh, wondering that how uh, if we can get that one in at least around four uh, four meter, five meter or even 2 meter close to the ground proximity that will be significantly easier for us to do on, on road testing and based on that data we can select the road section which was section we want to do our on road testing. So unfortunately we did not get anything I mean, until today we do not have that data. So what we do usually we first select a, a section of the road where we want to do our test and then and then we monitor that area for at least one month. Ideally, we try it when the wind is good and sometimes we were waiting with an instrumented vehicle, instrumented means all the equipment, everything ready within within 10, 20, 20 minutes notice. If it is there, we go. So you understand that we engineer, all engineers, all our research engineers, those are doing PhD masters and how big commitment you need, how big commitment you need, you need to be ready to go that sort of important um, situation to capture. So that is how we did. And I tell you one thing for sure, we never did on road testing without monitoring the weather condition and the wind condition on that section, never ever. We always measure the wind direction, we will always measure the average wind speed and also what is the temperature, what is the humidity and what, what is the atmospheric pressure. Always we measure it, not once, multiple equipments, multiple location throughout that 2 kilometer or 3 kilometer or 4 kilometer length, uh, then we do the testing because otherwise a, a lot of things will be variable. We cannot truly interpret our findings with the, with the, the things that we wanted to have and that is a little lesson and advice to for all of uh, to not all to, uh, for all of you if you are involved you must do it do not take granted for other people did that things because every section close to the ground proximity is different from other location and even with the road same road surface it doesn't matter still so this is how we did so that's why i'm familiar with all these things but of course we did not do the whole area we did only along the road site where we did the testing and that's the minimum thing we can do. Of course, maximum thing are in your hand in the future. All right. And now I show you another around 10 years data in Germany. Because why Germany? Why we all the time show a lot of things from Germany than the USA, than the than the Australia? Because in Germany, in Germany, after the Second World War. Germany did a lot of research in road vehicle aerodynamics and the road condition led by Wolf Hendis Hucho, Saidar Ahmed and a lot of other people in Germany and therefore a lot of other people Germany and those people and also Italy as well. Italy did a lot of uh, good work and those people published a wealth of data and that data is now our scientific base in a, in a, in a road vehicle aerodynamics, uh, in train aerodynamics uh, and also bus and track aerodynamics. We are using it in the world. We thank those people who did this great work for us. And now we are expecting that this part of the world also we get our data from India, from China, from other countries in this part of Asia. Uh, I must also say, I must also say uh, a lot of work also been done in uh, vehicle aerodynamics from, from Japan. I will show some graphs today, uh, some beautiful graphs and in fact those graphs are correct because we, we cross checked, we reproduced these things and this work also done, um, some people particularly Haruna uh, from, from Japan, uh, they, he did a lot of, and, uh, a lot of work there and his uh, work and his team that actually help us to move forward uh, very nicely and confidently. So these people and we really expect from this part of the world particularly India and China 
uh, to contribute in this area, uh, fill the gap and also move this science in industrial aerodynamics to, to, the, to the next step of this world. Because we cannot expect from Europe, because the Europe uh, situation is different now and also we cannot expect from North America uh, in this area. So we really expect from you this because of the share volume of the people and share volume of the opportunity and, that, and the human resources capability. So definitely it will help our science globally. Uh, to move forward. So now, this is around 50 years data. Look at here, wind related accident, monthly base, you can see there here, average data. So, uh, you cannot ignore young people, this wind, 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 uh, wind caused accident. Because every accident, for your also information, every accident in Australia, car accident. If anyone was injured or killed, that accident will be investigated by engineer. Engineer with a police uniform, but is coming from your specialty, mechanical, automotive, aerospace, manufacturing, those are coming from there. That is the rule of thumb in Australia. And I was lucky man. I was involved with one of the PhD supervision, a police officer, but mechanical engineer, uh, that her young lady and her PhD was on the friction coefficient on the road and tire, road surface and tire, uh, that uh, contact point. When the road surface is dry, when the road surface is little bit wet and when road surface has at least two or three millimeter water, so the friction coefficient will be same or not. And that was her PhD. Her name is Janelle Hartman. And you can find also in the internet search uh, her PhD thesis. I strongly encourage you, those who are interested, to know about that. Because the reason was based on her report, some people were released from the jail, considered is a te technically not the person is uh, guilty because it is the road condition. And some person were set in the jail because of that. So she wanted to make sure that the cases that she provided a report to the court because court do not listen any other people on those circumstances they only listen to the to the scientific expert and scientific expert it is not scientific normal teachers those who are professional engineer doing this work we call major vehicle collision unit and those report based on magistrate or in the court uh, the the judge decide that person will be guilty or not if the person is not fault in their technical technical fault is not the person's fault so therefore it is not considered on that so this is how she told that uh, she will be recalling some of the decision uh, request the court to review in light of her findings. So it is a very major thing. You see, our we, that's why I feel very, feel very proud of you because all of you are a part of the biggest engineering community. You see the, how you can contribute everywhere, anywhere in the world with your knowledge. So that's very important. So this is why this uh, you also need to take into account that what type of accident, whether it caused a wind, and if it is, then what you will be doing? You also need to select which location is this happening. For example, in our this graph, you can see this month, this particular month in January, there was a, a lot of wind related accident. So first of all, we need to know which location it is. And then if we see the all the most of the accident in particular location happen. So we have to then change the design of the road and also the driver behavior on the road section as well. We put some warning sign, we reduce the speed, a lot of other things will be done based on your report, how that section will be done. Young people, it is a lot of things are in your hand. Many of you don't even think about that way, but you now think about that, yes, how these things are in your hand. Based on your report, your scientific base, road design will be changed. And, and also sign or, or warning system, advisable system, all these things will be do, uh, established there based on your report. It is not that someone will say, oh, there was an accident here, oh, okay, reduce the speed. No. Or change the uh, road direction. No. Because it needs to be based on scientific evidence. Clear to everyone? So you see how your aerodynamics, road vehicle, um, the aerodynamics is helping you to do a lot of other things, even helping the civil engineer, how the road construction, how the bending will be done. Every bend on the road, anywhere in the world, if you done properly, every band, every intersection, the railway crossing, which is a 90 degree angle or 45 degree angle, 
that need to be investigated properly for the vehicles by the mechanical automotive manufacturing aerospace uh, engineers because they know the relative velocity and how the and also the centrifugal force at which speed they can negotiate safely with the band it is not civil engineers job it is the mechanical automotive manufacturing and uh, and aerospace engineer job because they all do the dynamics in their undergraduate course so they have to tell them how to design the road clear now okay so you understand why it is important we need to get all the data and based on the data we will be advising the relevant people and we will be helping them to take the right decision for the safe and safe and also not to be harmful way to operate the vehicles on that particular section of the road okay but of course unfortunately if we find that in january found all the accident not in one location then is a little bit difficult the which location we need to change but if you find the same location or close to the proximity is coming then you definitely need to take an action to change the road direction and also the other other precautionary things so now the question is this is the only work i found which is a very good work uh, mr kevin cooper uh, from canada and i am also very fortunate to meet him in 2001 in detroit conference kevin cooper uh, from uh, national research council of canada uh, they have a big wind tunnel he did a lot of works and um, an interesting thing many of you will be surprised that he actually did not do his phd but his contribution is so much we are very grateful to him so mr kevin cooper uh, based on his uh, statistical wind data he actually provided a graph what is the probability based on the wind speed and your car speed the what angle of the wind will be hitting you you're hitting it you might miss your vehicle so he came to a conclusion that in based on his data not the american data particularly canada not us canada so he said that it is very unlikely if you are driving at high speed your wind angle when you will be hitting you that will be more than 10 degree but we unfortunately do not have any independent data sas from other part of the world we have one data from kevin cooper from north america and another small one not a small one also very reasonably good one from germany it slightly varies but i did not show you here because i don't want to confuse you but this one is more or less you can use it for your data even i used in my phd uh, research as well and that is one of the reason why i did the maximum eo in my wind tunnel not more than 15 degree at different high speeds the only thing is if you are driving slowly say 30 km per hour 40 km per hour 20 km per hour your crosswind angle will be higher but if you are driving at 80 km or 100 km per hour your crosswind angle which will be hitting you it will not be more than 10 degree that's the things as per kevin cooper uh, research on this graph and this graph uh, not only kevin cooper it is going through the sae society of automotive engineers publication but also but also uh, mr hucho not mr professor hucho sorry my my uh, my apology professor hucho uh, he also he also said that is the uh, really at the moment available data we have so i in my lifetime i want to see a similar graph for our this part of the world for our asian part of the world um, but we don't have a uh, any anything from japan or korea so young people you have a lot of things to do in the future and this is the formula which i showed you on the other day the graph uh, that is how the relative velocity is calculated based on the wind velocity and the and 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 the vehicle velocity so you can get this one and of course you can get that angle as well and the formula is here and interesting thing uh, they also plot a nomogram a nomogram here the if you don't like that formula if you don't like this formula to find out all this complicated angle then you can use you can use this uh, no, nomogram Uh, it's a little bit of complicated uh, com it is a little bit of complicated but you need to little bit of spend time uh, it is not i also looked at very carefully i never used this nomogram in my uh, wind direction calculation so i looked at i saw it is a little bit of confusing so you need to put little bit of time 
on that to understand it properly. Clear to everyone? You need to spend a little bit of time on this. But I, I strongly encourage uh, whenever you do, you do your own test. <laughs> own test, that is my advice. And the other thing is, there are other nom nomograms we use for uh, the conversion of the vibration from the meter per second uh, to, to meter per second square or from their decibel and that nom nomogram is a very simple easy and uh, th but that is not here so therefore i do not i do not advise you to use this nomogram because it's a little bit complicated easily you can make mistake but if you need you really do this uh, formula and i know in indian uh, our engineering uh, community like you all of you are coming from very good mathematical background so therefore it will not be a problem for all of you because that's why you have a good mathematical skills that's why you are in engineering profession in, Inge in india Okay, so I mean, other country, unfortunately, now many engineering graduates are coming, not very strong mathematical background. Okay, but you are in that respect. So, it is not a problem for you. All right, so here is the dilemma how we can replicate the atmospheric boundary condition in our testing, in our evaluation. And this is the nice scenario in the wind tunnel. Does it look at all? our atmospheric boundary condition no not at all so therefore based on this scenario if i say that your car is under the this this crosswind is very good uh, it will not be good particularly car maybe high that high rise train maybe it is some of some of the thing will be correct but for car which height is around 1.4 1.5 meter you cannot predict very well and in addition to that in the wind tunnel we also have a little bit of boundary layer and that boundary layer usually grows. I will show you tomorrow that from the contraction, what the entry point from gradually it will be increasing as you go further and further in the test section. In our automated industrial wind tunnel, where we put our model, that is around 100 millimeter the boundary layer thickness because we measured that. Okay. And there is another one, some wind tunnel, only few, only few in the world, not a single one in Australia, uh, because in Australia we don't have uh, any wind tunnel. To, to replicate the crosswind situ situation in the uh, section, but there are some wind tunnel, they do not make it public. I heard that in Germany, they have win one wind tunnel. But I never been to that wind tunnel, uh, therefore I cannot tell you. Uh, I asked my supervisor, uh, PhD supervisor, Professor Simon Watkins, and he told, he also told me that he could not go there either. So I cannot, I cannot share any notes with you on that the how complexity that they actually face so uh, this is the natural wind a uh, natural uh, wind in the road on the road so this is why all cars all car manufacturers uh, as it is a very complicated in the wind tunnel they do this test on the real wind condition on the real uh, real wind condition which i'll be showing you in the next slides the how the section of the uh, of the road they mark it and um, and, but I never personally involved with the crosswind test in the in the probing ground, uh, neither Ford nor Holden, uh, General Motors Holden. But I was involved with other things, with the spray. The truck spray is coming with the semi trailer, big truck you have in, in India as well. Very big truck. The semi trailer. When you drive behind that truck, there is a lot of spray comes, and I was involved with the testing of that spray of the truck in the probing ground. So now I show you. There are two way. Uh, don't worry. At the moment, don't focus on this. It is a rollover. <laughs> there is a there is a show you a little bit of pic, uh, picture of view that yes, how the situation can be. Uh, so, so this is the test section, and they put this angle is 60 degree from here. This is a blower. So they create on the road side on around this is the this is the road section or the test section and this they blow the wind and create a different type of turbulence and different type of gustiness uh, all these things they try to replicate as natural wind as possible but it is not 100 percent but that's the only thing we can do apart from natural absolutely natural wind so therefore what they do when the car uh, there's an open loop one and the closed loop one i'll come closed loop one in a second so this one first we try to understand so this is the a lot of blower and that usually in the test section length is a 16.6 meter 
Why the 16.6, not 16 meter or 17 meter? Because initially that test introduced in America in a foot. Foot and yards. So when foot and yards you convert to meter, unfortunately there will be fraction. There will be a fraction. So that is standard. We are also using, although in Australia we do not use any more foot pound system, but we use the MK system, meter uh, kilogram second system. So in Australia, uh, still we are used that particular methods in the probing ground, in the probing ground. And I saw uh, that there are some system we have in Australia when our Ford Motor Company and General Motors they had in Australia the operation. Okay. So, and usually the center line, you see the center line here, and they they check when the car is vehicle is coming, the how much it is deviated from this center line, from this center line. So that is showing a replication. A, 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 a representative picture. It may not all vehicles will be that that uh, there. Maybe some vehicle will not be at all, or some vehicle will be very small deviation. So it, it depends on vehicle, vehicle weight, vehicle size. Uh, all these things you need to calculate and measure it, and you need to do not once, multiple times to get an average. Okay. And another important thing is it is also a steering, because when gusting has come the how your steer air hold you because otherwise sometimes you be panic mode uh, so the, all these things and the at the and the driver of the vehicle it is a non normal driver it is a test driver and test driver is the engineer at least your btech you call it btech in india so it is not your diploma engineer not your technicians it is a full fledged engineer research engineer who can give authentic information both subjective and objective so you understand that our engineers how much they need to uh, make our hands dirty because that's the things is a important part but that give you also also the confidence also also the confidence so that is called uh, open loop and this is called closed loop so this is a control uh, area here and then so that you can align properly and you come here again the same distance as you can see 16.6 meter and then of course you come here and this is how uh, the uh, cro uh, this, uh, this uh, as I said, artificially you create a, a, a gustiness wind, and then so that you can go there. This is how we do on road testing. But but there is another one I said. Remember what I said? Sometimes we are with this car, we are waiting a good moment, like in army or the fire brigade. You are ready with the instrument. As soon as natural wind is coming, something very, uh, then you immediately go there and do the testing clear that is called absolutely natural one and for that you need to wait fully prepared okay and usually usually uh, the this that sort of probing ground it is far far away from the city far far away a special place and in some places you don't have any uh, any place to live there so you have to take a tent you have to take a generator you have to take a portable toilet everything in those area very often because you want to get as undisturbed as possible not from surrounding any objects so this is why this is the restricted and some of this probing ground where it is a circular type like that they also do military vehicles as well so therefore this is our very restricted i remember when i was in 1997 uh, i was involved with the track testing we were the whole team of our phd uh, of all our PhD friends, those who are under one supervisor, all of them we went there, 10 people with all generator, two generators. Because if one failed, then what about the other one? So we have a generator, we had uh, all the foods, we have a portable, uh, this uh, fridge, everything full fledged. Uh, we went there and we went, uh, we took us a tent. Uh, so at night we used to have in the tent, uh, uh, to sleep in the tent, and everything they are like a medieval society. And all of the are our research engineer and PhD engineer. So these are the things you will be doing in the future when you will be uh, working in this area, and that is our expectation. All right. So with this note, uh, we we look for our uh, for our aerodynamics of the car and uh, and vehicle refinement, and we will be now moving to wind noise, wind noise, and I will also talk about the track aerodynamics a little bit uh, either tomorrow or after tomorrow because that is also an important thing uh, because the tracks are consuming a lot of a lot of energy 
a lot of fuel so you need to look at significantly there and their shapes are unfortunately not very very streamlined and that is the things we need to look at so let us go to talk about the wind noise now what is noise or sound maybe noise we do not say bad word let us go say nice word sound the sound is a pressure fluctuation because when I speak you can listen how how you are listening because I am creating a lot of vibration of the air and that uh, vibration is moving and when it comes to your air and your air drum can 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 sense that vibration and based on your the thing that you recorded in your head and I recorded in my head that when I speak English you also know that it is matching artificial intelligence of course it is not artificial intelligence it is a natural intelligence and then it recognizes what are the things I am saying and you understand it clear to everyone so so the sound definition is that it is a it is a fluctuation of air pressure from the mean atmospheric pressure if this pressure per second is minimum 20 times changes per second up to 20,000 times that is called human a healthy human's hearing range if the sound or if the vibration less than 20 times per second you will not be able to hear if it is more than 20 20,000 times per second you will also will not be here clear to everyone and now my question to you young people and any unwanted sound that you do not like that is called noise clear to everyone any unwanted sound which or undesirable sound maybe not unwanted you, you say no we are diplomatic people we say nice word any undesirable sound we call noise you clear okay now if the sound less than 20 times per second vibrates or creates the fluctuation is less than 20 times oh another important thing it need to have an elastic media so the media can expand move if it cannot then it will not transfer that is why sound cannot be transferred in vacuum because there is no media to do these things it is very important so you have to use the other way there so now if the sound or the pressure fluctuates less than 20 times that is called infrasound if any fluctuation that air pressure fluctuation more than 20,000 times per second that is called ultrasound clear to everyone ok now any vibration per second that we call cycle and that cycle we call hearts always try to remember simple way do not need to have a very complicated word and all these things the way I explain to you if you try to remember this way you will never forget simple way and we engineer always need a simple word we do not need to complicate all these things here and there and after sometimes we forget we do not need so any fluctuation per second and that rate is called hertz is a 20 hertz it means 20 times fluctuate per second 20,000 it means 20 twenty thousand times it per second it is fluctuating per second one second one second that many times so now my little question to you those who are sitting in this room many of you are all of you have a little bit different age variation some of you have a two year senior some three years junior something like that but you are very close to within five six seven years range uh, of the age difference now do you think that your hearing range is between starting from 20, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz? No. Not only aging, aging of course, yes you are right, but there are some other things. How much you are exposed to the sound? 
Some people always have a headphone here. They are destroying their hearing power. Hearing range. That's, that's the extra thing, additional thing. But you, you are absolutely right with the aging. That 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz sometimes we also call. That is for a healthy, very young child. But when I did my PhD, because I talk about these things uh, uh, tomorrow about the acoustic measurement and other things, and I also tested my own hearing. I was talking about 1997, 1998. I tested, okay, we do the acoustic testing. First of all, let's go to check our own hearing range. Yeah, are we within 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz? I found for me in 1997, my hearing range, I could not hear anything less than 50 hertz. And I could not hear also anything more than 15,000 hertz. So my 5,000 hertz from the last bell is gone. And maybe today if I test, my hearing range will be significantly lower than that. Clear to everyone? So all of you are sitting in this room, your hearing range unfortunately not start from 20 and it will not finish at 20,000 hertz. You will be in between. And now you can say, why when you work with a dog or a cat, sometimes they can be reacting with something but you do not react because the dog and cat their hearing range is little bit more than us they can hear a lower frequency than 20 hertz and they can also hear more than 20,000 hertz per, per second also as a result as a result sometimes they can hear a noise they react to that but you for you to you it looks like a strange thing is happening Maybe some superpower is doing something, but actually not. No superpower there. It is because of the hearing range. Clear? Okay. So, there are two types of uh, noise or sound. One is called a structure bond, and that is molecular vibration of a, of a rigid structure that actually creates a noise that is called a structure bond. And the other is, of course, the fluctuation of the air or turbulence flow or the flow separation. Uh, that creates the noise that we call uh, aerodynamically induced noise or aeroacoustic noise. In some book, they write aeroacoustic noise, a noise that is generated by airflow. Okay, airflow itself or airflow with the interaction of the solid object. Either way. But again, the noise source is coming due to the airflow. So that flow we call, uh, if a very uh, gentle word, nice word, is aerodynamically induced noise or sometimes we also call aeroacoustic noise. So when you see in the book or some places that essentially do both two things are essentially the same thing. Okay. So this is our uh, main thing and uh, as I also said there are some called uh, broadband noise. Broadband noise uh, also you need to under or broadband sound uh, it need to understand that it is uh, at the moment in this room we do not have a pure sound. We have a broad sound. Why? Because I am talking and your fan is making noise. And maybe some other noise also coming which we cannot hear maybe because of the, our hearing is little bit fall down. So when you have a combination of multiple noise or sound at different frequency, they combine them together that we call a white noise. And in nature, all the time you hear white noise. When you go to the street, you hear a very crowdy, different type of sound is coming, some you understand, some you don't understand. Uh, so, all this is a combination. So, you essentially, based on sound processing knowledge, you can isolate them. You can segregate them that who is causing this noise. Uh, if you are, uh, same thing also with the vibration, you can um, isolating the vibration, the actually it is causing bearing or it is a ball of the bearing or it is the shaft or it is the whirling or some other things it, it is causing. All these things you can do same way as sound. So the processing, signal processing for sound is exactly the same as we do our sound and the vibration. So they are, that's why in many university uh, this topic is usually called uh, noise and vibration or sound and vibration. Uh, that's how they do. Uh, 
So, uh, there are some frequency which distribute throughout the long range of the frequency. Sometimes we also call white noise. And white noise, sometimes we also call wind rush noise. Right? Shh, continuous noise, that is called. Uh, again, I am uh, trying to replicate, but maybe not very correct way. So, that is a shh. That noise is coming. It is actually a different frequency uh, over, the, over the entire range of the frequency is coming. So, that is called wind rush noise. Now, I already told you about that one, that our sound um, usually, uh, that audible sound, 20 to 20,000 hertz and um, any sound we already talked about the inverse sound ultrasound and then human ear that's a very interesting thing that's a very interesting thing our human ear is a very intelligent um, intelligent tool is unbelievable tool it is not like microphone microphone is not an intelligent way it listen or record the signal but our human how our human ear can detect the sound very low amplitude and also very high amplitude for example when you plot an excel plot if you put very low band then sometimes the high one is stop out right when you put the limit the vertical axis so what you need to do if you want to show in the same scale the very big value and the small value then you need to use the logarithm scale then it squeezes and you can see the highest value and the lowest value in your graph very nicely and that is the thing nature gave, gave, uh, gave us this gift our our ear is our hearing our ear is a logarithmic scale so therefore any sound you record with a microphone that does not represent you the true hearing power of your ear so you need to convert it to logarithmic scale and then you can represent it if you can see that clear everyone so our human ear not a linear hearing is a logarithmic based on 10 not e not the natural one based on 10 all right uh, and then uh, we usually measure the sound with the meter or microphone use the uh, sound level pressure sound level pressure it is essentially a ratio a ratio of the two sound one sound what do you measure with the microphone and the other sound is the very very tiny tiny bit of sound that is we call 20 micro pascal and that is the we call faint sound and that is the standard we have taken anywhere in the world and with that one we compare what are the things you measured of course in the logarithmic scale based on 10 and therefore that ratio of the sound we call sound pressure level SPL it can be linear it can be non-linear we'll be coming in a second about that so um, and the unit of sound <laughs> every one of you know uh, most probably from your uh, university usually we we call decibel decibel it is the, um, is the Alexander Graham Bell uh, in his uh, we, to honor him because he did a lot of audio you things you know uh, microphone many other things he uh, developed and he also entrepreneur was also he did and in his honor we call it that a decibel as I said it is a ratio of the two pressure of the sound or noise if it is unwanted sound you call noise same thing so I show you this is the mathematical formula uh, we use for sound level pressure uh, the SPL dB usually right and now 10 times log 10 P square the measured pressure you square it and the reference pressure that is a 20 micro Pascal you remember Newton times Newton per meter square is a Pascal PA so therefore is a pressure force time the meter square uh, sorry uh, force per meter square that's the actually force divided by the area where it works so that is coming from there so it is sometimes called micro pascal, uh, micro pascal 20 micro pascal so now why 20 uh, so now have a look this one this one uh, this two here is a two here is a two and here is your log so you can this two you can come here it will be 20 
So in some book, in some book you will not find a square, p square by reference p square. You will find in some book here is a 20 times log 10 p that you measure and the p reference this one. Clear to everyone now? But I put it original one and then you can convert it to your, your things. So this is how uh, you measure and this is the things as you can see wavelength and how the wavelength is calculated and as you say higher frequency wavelength is a smaller 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 okay so it contains more energy and now I give you a little bit of representative uh, schematics of of that a different uh, situation when you are sitting under the tree if wind is not blowing very little gentle thing noise will be there very faint close to a little bit over than more than faint and that level is here as you can see that is the knowledge shows wood and other things everything is moving now wood also moving tree also moves so they will create a little bit of vibration and that vibration air fluctuation if it is more than 20 hertz you can listen so that is if you there is energy because by I, if you, if you, when you talk, and I am talking here, I can hold my hand here in front of my mouth. I can see how much actually pressure I create by mouth. So that's the energy is fluctuating and coming to you. So uh, that is the you can see the heavy track. What is the noise level? And someone is uh, making uh, you know typing in the office environment. What is the noise? And someone is uh, you saw the drilling on the road, making the hole or make, breaking the concrete that noise and of course the biggest noise is coming when the aircraft is flying from the air uh, from the from the runaway okay because the all engine of the aircraft during the takeoff they work maximum that is the only time on the aircraft when it is take off and not even long time only up to 10 meter 10.7 meter exactly okay so first when it is running uh, when it is taking off at 10.7 meter high the pilot should decide whether pilot will continue the uh, takeoff or about the takeoff a fraction of a second i think uh, to, uh, by law is you know, two or three seconds they need to hold on that condition and they still have enough runway in front of them if they abort so that they can land so up to that point your engine is running how many injury you have doesn't matter all are maximum and thereafter slowing down slowing down slowing down and the and the and the nominal is when you are horizontal flight okay so that's how and that's why you find a big thrust big noise and all these things is coming when the aircraft is flying and you are here somewhere in this region 130 db and more and now i show you how our hearing range looks like and that is the SPL and that is your frequency look at here this is our human young child very good health with uh, not defective ear or something or any, any any medical condition this is our area of the noise level that is our 20 20 20 to 20 thousand hertz clear to everyone and when we talk we are actually creating in this range so when you hear me I am actually you and I we are in this session in this in this area and when we hear music some music will be here for example if you are hearing a Ravindra Sangeet maybe somewhere here because which is a low intonation not a very high intense but if you go to disco you are somewhere here you know all the young people you know with the drum and everything is uh, hearing the big noise so it is there but i strongly request you not to be in that situation for a long time otherwise your valuable hearing power will gone it will never recover back it's gone for it gone once it gone forever you will not get it back therefore you cannot repair back no medicine in this world they can tell you all the interesting thing but actually it will not happen uh, happen you can check your hearing power yourself with the microphone so this is the scenario our situation now um, i also put little bit of source uh, bruel and car from denmark this company is the is the in my knowledge is one of the most reliable company they used to produce all the scientific microphone 
a single microphone when I did my PhD it cost more than three thousand dollar then we use that sort of microphone and this company so uh, we also uh, when I did uh, in my study and also for, uh, later on my PhD student and other people when they did the work they usually compare with our other microphone which is a little bit cheaper against this microphone as well we checked cross checked in addition to that we independently do other things as well so now there are four waiting system now remember our human 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 ear is not a linear it is a logarithmic clear to everyone so therefore um, some intelligent way this graph is showing horizontal axis is the frequency vertical axis is the sound level pressure and this is the a1 a1 is this one that is our human perception of sound or a noise as we hear we perceive by our ear okay so if you measure a noise with the microphone unless you put the waiting system of a it will not be representative of your hearing perception so but there are some equipment you can buy that equipment automatically tell you that you want to measure your noise with the microphone and they have a little bit of processing system inside and that they can say you you want a waiting or a b waiting or a c waiting or a d waiting but most of this sound level meter meter they do not have all of the all of the four they usually have a or a d and uh, b and c nowadays they are not using it because that's the problem is here you see here the a approximate the inverted equal loudness contour of low sound pressure level and the then the b is is a medium sound level pressure level it has a little bit of uh, very difficult to differentiate between these two using our normal equipment and also the the complicated electronics uh, processing system uh, it is very not very meaningful so this is why at the moment around the world they do not want to use the a uh, sorry uh, not a b and c my apology not this a one this one b medium and the high sp level these are we are not doing it and we we are neglecting it only we use a and d and d is used only for aircraft it is not for aircraft noise when the aircraft is taking off so our most of the sound level pressure when you measure the wind noise uh, or wind or sound they are a waiting because it is easier and simple it's electronics inside the sound level meter it is not complicated uh, it can be even normal linear sound use the microphone you can also uh, convert to a waiting with the matlab uh, i'm not sure how many of you are very familiar with the matlab matlab has a uh, signal processing toolbox and with that you can convert all of them okay matlab is a very powerful robust um, system you cannot do in excel but you can do in the matlab you can wait and there you can also use the windowing system and the overlapping system uh, to a lot of other things you can do in matlab uh, that is very important so this is how we are doing uh, so in most uh, equipment you will find a and d a d is for aircraft we are not using for human perception uh, and and the a is waiting most of the our things so therefore when we when we measure the wind noise we always try to get as a human perception but with a single microphone even three thousand dollar one expensive one or even the cheap one we do not get the sound level as human perception so this is why there is another tools they developed uh, some scientists developed uh, it is mainly germany they developed and then japan developed later on i do not know at this moment is any other country separately developed similar equipment and it is called artificial head system artificial head system i'll show you tomorrow a picture of that uh, that artificial head system uh, it has a two microphone in the air in the hole looks like a human uh, human uh, head and with that it has a lot of el complicated electronic electronic system so when we record the signal with these two microphone uh, it it hears both in this ear and this ear and then it combines them together and it did the processing inside with the inbuilt logarithmic scale and it gives you a waiting signal and that is more human noise perceived by human it is close to it is not 100 percent replacement of human because we cannot replicate 100 percent human human hearing things but it is close to and that is called artificial head system 
in some book or some research paper they also say Aken head Aken head it means the uh, company that developed it in Germany uh, by their name it is called Aken head Aken head and I'll, I'll write down that things uh, tomorrow when I show you uh, you can remember that not a cheap instrument um, the one that we have at RMIT uh, we bought it in I think uh, 1995 or something I did not buy it uh, when I was a, a PhD student it, it was done by a couple of years ago by our other PhD student uh, uh, for his for his project but university bought it and at that time it was $120,000 okay around 1995 all right so uh, quickly how many slides we have I, I still so now where do you want to finish it what's the time now we still have a little bit of time uh, yes. oh okay oh all right okay fine very good we'll be finishing on time then so now I show you some of the interesting graph normally a pure sine wave if you record your wave will be like that periodic periodic okay and this sine wave you can looking at the it is a time is it we call time domain signal it means horizontal axis is the time how many seconds you recorded in vertical axis it shows what is the pressure that sound actually creates we call amplitude or sometimes we also call pressure or in some book they call magnitude so it does not matter essentially the same thing you need to know which unit it is if it is a pressure then it will be Pascal if it is not pressure then something else create everyone you need to know about that so based on this you cannot say which particular frequency it is happening if you look at young people if you look at only this graph you can only see that is the highest peak that is the lowest peak correct that is the high magnitude you can see that in terms of amplitude you can see but you cannot say this particular wave which frequency is happening it is a 10 hertz 20 hertz 30 hertz 40 hertz very difficult although you can calculate one signal mathematically but multiple signal together no so what do we need to do we need to we need to convert this time domain signal why time domain because horizontal axis is a time domain time that's why the time domain signal to frequency domain signal amplitude still will be there but it will now make it frequency the horizontal axis and to process to convert this a time domain magnitude signal to a frequency domain signal you need to use the first Fourier transform and Fourier transform you have done in high school math or university math Laplace transform Fourier transform all you have done in your math so but we don't want to use your all math what are the things you learn is the first Fourier transform and the first Fourier transform it converts a time domain signal to frequency domain signal nothing else in another word it is split it, if it is a multiple signal together it splits each of them segment separately and it shows which frequency is happening so therefore you can see it is a equal one signal all the equal as a result it shows one spike and one spike it means it is a one pure one type of signal it is not together two three signal if it has a two or three signal together combine this one then it will be two or three different pike at different frequency and this one will give you say if you have a unit here based on that you can exactly identify at which frequency it is happening and if you cannot identify that you cannot take a decision who is actually causing it who is actually creating it because usually you have album a, a catalog based on catalog experimentally those are doing in the laboratory environment they record it and based on that you can identify the similar approach for also vibration you get the vibration signal on the time and then you convert to FFT and you get it uh, the uh, your frequency domain signal and then based on that you most probably will f find one spike two spike three spike and and based on that you know the first spike in which frequency second spike at which frequency and based on that you can go back to your catalog and then you know when the bearing the ball is broken what sort of vibration it will create or what sort of noise it will create 
So based on that, you identify, ah, okay, it is not the whole thing. It is the, is the ball of the bearing or it is the separator. Remember the, uh, uh, the ball bearing that is separator, hold it together, two, two ball together so that it will not move its own place. And sometimes separator also breaks down. So the separator also create a different sound and different vibration. And exactly based on that frequency, you can identify it is a separator or not. Or it is a, when the shaft is rotating, there is a sometimes deflection is happening in between at a critical whirling speed. And that also you can identify. So this is how we identify our human being. Not only wind noise, the people, those who know the signal processing, usually our mechanical automotive manufacturing, aerospace engineering student, they know, they, they can specialize in this area. And once you know, you can now work for a good purpose or a bad purpose. Good purpose is, of course, all these things, and bad purpose is the military thing or intelligent thing. You can record some a lot of sound or a inter, we call interception of the uh, of the space, and then you can process the signal, recorded signal, and then you can pinpoint that it is a talk of Professor Firoz Alam or a, or Professor Akharanjan Pal. You can find identify because my frequency that I create it will not be matching with the our uh, professor uh, well, it will not be same so this way you can identify that that space was phyloses or that space was um, is the oxers or someone else's and that is how the people those who are processing the signal people like you are doing that thing so it is a very interesting tool very important skills and the acoustic signal processing and then it shows you different type of other signal because this signal definitely has it with other signal combined two sine waves that look at here this two sine waves time domain signal you apply FFT and you get two spike at different frequencies so you can identify clearly the which signal sine wave at which frequency then you can get get it back there and then this sort of signal is a random it can create a many signal together in this room our fan even interesting thing each of the fan which fan is actually making noise we can also identify is that this fan, that fan, or this fan? Because all of them is slightly manufacturing defe defect is different, and they, they will create a different uh, noise. Therefore, in this room, if I have a microphone, I record the signal, and that signal with time domain maybe five se five second, ten second, or twenty second data with very high frequency um, sampling, I can put their FFT in in a, in, a, in in a MATLAB, and I can find out the these are. Uh, frequency domain signal I can pinpoint that which fan is actually doing it here and where is a Firoz is uh, Firoz is talking whether it is a Firoz or someone else also talked during that time clear so this is how we do signal processing very important tool uh, it is not a rocket science uh, every one of you can can uh, get these things and in my PhD uh, in my PhD my part was the aerodynamics and aeroacoustics so therefore I did everything all these things by my own hand I recorded the signal, I will show you later and then that signal I processed from the time domain to the frequency domain and it took a lot of time but we did it, I did it. So that is why I know exactly how you do these things in, in real life and any, many of you can be also specializing in this area. So let us go to see quickly our cars, that is the general thing how we do but I will be also showing you tomorrow the how actually we record the signal. What are the things you need to take into account? I showed you only the preamble, how you do it. But tomorrow I will show you how actually you, we record the signal, what is the process, what is the equipment, what are the things we need to do the testing and how we get the signal to process ultimately find the FFT, applying FFT to get the frequency domain signal. Time domain to frequency. Time domain will give you amplitude, frequency domain give you at which frequency it is happening, who is causing it, simple one. The who is causing it, who is the culprit in simple one not a, not a uh, uh, you know saying bad thing to anyone or anything or any object the who is actually causing that fluctuation of the of the air if it is a sound or if it's fluctuation or the creation of the vibration who causing it all right so if you look at the car look at here you are sitting somewhere here this is your head you are sitting on this seat and your head is perceive, perceiving look at there how many noise wind noise, engine noise, uh, transmission noise, if you have a manual transmission you can all, even the other transmission also have some noise and then you have also road tire interaction noise. 
Hey, young people, road is not a very very plain. In India, is even not not not, not more plain. Okay, so um, and if <laughs> not only no, no no don't say about India is a bad thing, but every country, unfortunately, if you do not do properly the road surface, the road surface will be uh, very um, uh, OB. Uh, because road surface in uh, in America they reconstitute around 600 millimeter 0.6 of a meter you start from 0.6 of a meter I mean almost one meter depth and you need to make a different level with the different things and then finally you put on the top is the asphalt but in Europe they do 1.8 meter so therefore their road is much better more stable can carry higher load and stay for a longer time without waving. But in America, North America, they usually they got shortcut. And I believe our Indian subcontinent, including India and Bangladesh, we maybe even look for more shortcut. So, so you understand what's going on. And one point, one point eight meter depth. The when we start from there, remember one point eight meter depth, almost two meter. We prepare various level, at least maybe 20, 30 different level for the road to because the road when the road is going and the weight and weight need to be distributed nicely and the water on the top also need to be drained nicely so that it cannot go inside it need to be drained out because if it goes inside then it will be destroying other combination thing so all these things is and also it absorbs the vibration and uniformly because road road create also vibration a road i mean not road the, with the with the interaction of the road and the vehicle so that vibration need to be nicely distributed around the surrounding not in one location more other location less then there will be stress and that will also create a non uh, non desired uh, the surface, uh, surface movement we don't want that so this is why this is why uh, that so if you make a road 1.8 meter depth and you create the surface and uh, that road can survive for up to 25 years again based on weather condition or other condition it is just as a rule of thumb but it is not the 100 percent of course you regularly you need to maintain as well uh, uh, but the one but the point six meter one in a north america uh, and um, i do not know in australia most probably we are following the america as well i believe, I believe. maybe i am wrong but uh, uh, i could not get any uh, more data there uh, but our, our indian subcontinent definitely not most of the road not not 1.8 meter is definitely less so as a result um, our road condition will be a uh, little bit less uh, 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 less uh, I mean uh, it, its condition will not be for a long time okay in addition to that you also need to maintain the road uh, um, uh, the maintenance all right so but I don't want to go into that detail. I'm more than happy to talk about what are the layer what are the different thing you do uh, but not not in this subject not in this uh, course today I want to tell, tell about that so uh, that is another problem so the road tire interaction uneven road uh, anywhere in the world the road can change so that uh, that also transfer and create noise so all the noise is coming here 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 and of course who will be perceiving the noise only you and the other occupant correct so so and how do you know young people that this noise is caused by engine other noise is caused by your uh, transmission or gearbox or differential or some other things or it is coming from the our uneven surface of the road so therefore what do you do you record the signal with the microphone and then and that signal that signal is your time domain signal it give you a magnitude of the sound pressure level combined everything together and including wind noise and then but you don't know who is the guilty person is it a aerodynamic wind or it is a engine or it is the road surface and road surface not only that also tire tire grip you know the tire is a thread because we have a session today about that so and they are based on that also the sound will be different so therefore you can identify who is causing it that time domain signal you convert with the FFT fast Fourier transform to a frequency domain signal and then you will see all the spike a lot of spike not this one look at here not only one 
you will find maybe at least uh, at least three four five six seven of them and each of them representing engine wind noise and the and the road surface or even tire or even tire so all of these things you identify and you go from there and you see how beautiful tool the other way you cannot do it so this is we how we do it so now if you look at this is the graph it shows you the with the based on vehicle speed aerodynamic noise look at the aerodynamic noise less than 60 kilometer virtually you cannot hear you hear all the engine noise road surface noise all other things every possible noise you can hear but not the wind noise wind noise all of a sudden look at the how it goes how it goes so in australia we can drive our main highway is a 110 kilometer okay so i hope that uh, because at, it's the moment, it's, at the moment it is recording that's why i want to don't say that what speed i drive uh, because otherwise uh, some people will say hey firoz you are doing all the bad thing um, in, in also uh, is spoiling our indian um, our indian young people so, uh, so <laughs> but we have a territory in australia uh, where we don't have a speed limit but it is not in melbourne not in sydney not in brisbane not in Perth, not in adelaide or not in hobart we cannot do it there so there are northern territory we have a small less populated area there we have some section where there is no speed limit so you can you can make your fun there so and that but that is there but in germany in uh, the freeway they call autobahn the autobahn you have no limit you can drive 250 kilometer if your car allowed it and you can drive at 100 kilometer you can drive 200 kilometer you can drive 150 kilometer 60 kilometer no problem and there this wind wind noise will be somewhere here clear to everyone because it is going with the with the exponent uh, with the with the cubical way and that also shows you the uh, uh, what happened uh, I can see the screen here. Oh, okay, good, good, good. So uh, you can see this is our wind noise. This is the power train noise. Power train, it means you don't understand that thing, uh, the engine noise. And then this is our ah, oh, very good. Look at here the tire noise. Now I draw your attention on one important thing: the different tire based on different thread on the on the tire. This line will be slightly different some will be little bit lower some will be little bit higher clear to everyone based on the tire thread because tire thread is designed its main objective is to have a friction so that it doesn't allow it to skid and also a longer life around 60,000 kilometer uh, the range minimum minimum but some tire can go depends on how quickly you apply brake if you quickly apply brake your tire life will be shortened okay so but if you are very responsible driver you you slow down your vehicle long away where you need to stop in that case your tire is working less threat uh, less stressful and it it, it survived even more than 60,000 kilometer so this is the things you need to take into account and overall noise is coming together here but within our um, the the FFT we can we can identify all of them and plot this beautiful graph this graph you can you can draw and now i show you uh, there are three source uh, type of source we have uh, model of the acoustic noise noise that is generated by of course uh, acoustic uh, it can be also in our case we are taking only the noise that generated by the wind we are not taking the structural joint, uh, structural noise here so therefore we have a monopole noise uh, usually usually it is an unsteady volumetric flow and particularly the noise that you hear from the exhaust system you know the exhaust system the where the all the exhaust is coming out the muffler all these things you call it that noise essentially the engine noise that is the monopole and then we have a dipole dipole is usually it is coming from vortex shading you know that vortex shading behind the cylinder behind the surface you saw there is a is a periodical shading like that is going and that shedding also create a fluctuation if you want to hear that noise uh, you can record that and that sort of noise we call dipole it means two different ways it is happening at the same time but again unsteady unsteady flow and then quadruple noise 
uh, usually when one fluid collide with other fluid and one of the bright example is how the electricity you know the lightning is created you know that when one layer of wind is uh, the going and the other one friction and then create a static uh, charge and that charge is coming out of the lightning when it comes to the uh, ground so same thing also happening when it is happening they also create a noise as well and that noise is we call quadruple so therefore usually usually turbulent shear uh, and turbulent shear layer and also jet flows also jet flows behind the behind the engine behind the engine and now there are many noise we have in the car leak noise cavity noise vortex shedding vortex shedding in the car is antenna but now that beautiful antenna which is to come off like that and that antenna is new car they don't have it they are actually put a little uh, like a fin uh, the shark fin type things at the at the top of the car at the rear so therefore we luckily uh, we manage this problem some uh, intelligent people thought about that they put it back there and what a great thing we can get out of that sh water shedding and wind rust noise unfortunately still we are having it we could not eliminate it uh, completely so this is the things we need to deal with and now quickly see quickly see that um, remember this graph is not a new I showed you yesterday uh, a lot of location because every every location as a rule of thumb every location where you have a flow separation there will noise will be created where you have a flow separation like that a reverse flow like that that this area this area and particularly this area I draw your attention I'll show you in a second a be nice graph here and I'll be talking about that things tomorrow as well because that is the area where I my PhD is okay so I'll be show, telling you a lot of story about that uh, the, how we did all these things and uh, and then on the back but back noise when you drive the car this noise not very very quickly come to your ear because you are ahead it is calm it will come but little not a lot so that's why most people are not interested about that what's going on but they are interested in this side in this side why because it is close to your ear if you are in America you are sitting on this side as a driver if you are in Europe except UK and Ireland you are still in this side if you are in your neighboring, neighboring country China you are also sitting in this side but if you are in Australia or in India or in Bangladesh or Pakistan all this country here our Indian uh, not, what is called uh, British colonial country except, except uh, Canada Canada they switched to American system so they are sitting driver here all right for, for me I learned driving on this side but I am driving now on this side but whenever I go to America if I stay more than one week any places I rent a car and I drive it because my this is my original one where I learned so I have no problem uh, but uh, some of you need to little bit it is not a rocket science you need to do maybe one week or two weeks then you will be used to it is not the things uh, difficult at all you uh, will be, be so don't need to be panic as oh, I only know this side other side no it will not be a problem so now uh, look at here this is now there are three pillars in a car pillars you know the pillar where you structure you put so three pillars this is called pillar a this is called a pillar is the structural joint between the wind screen and the side window this joint is called a pillar and some book they also called a post a post so don't need to be panic it is the same thing but most books or most literature they call a pillar a pillar and this one you see the middle one the two side window this one and this one it connected here that is called b pillar the a pillar in the front b pillar on the side and then the side on the rear window and the rear side this one where i am showing with the laser pointer that is called c pillar so a pillar is the structure of course the same thing also you have on the other side two of them both sides so now you can say why we need this pillar it's very vital the reason is it if in case your car roll over and you consider that your roof this one is on the ground and your wheel is on the up ups and down 
and you are inside what do you want at the time you want to get out right that's the first thing but if you cannot get out what do you want then what is your second option that it will not squeeze you correct first your first intention is to get out at as, as quickly as possible correct if you cannot get out what will be your in second intention will be, okay okay someone will be rescuing me later but i don't want my me that my car wait squeeze me so this is why as a design rule any country in the world that your envelope of a car it this this a pillar b pillar and c pillar need to be strong enough so when the car is ups and down it does not squeeze you so we call it structural joint and structural pillar or sometimes they call also post the pillar what came from there because it can hold your entire weight this three pillar on one side three pillar on the other side clear to everyone but the point is ideally for safety for other things for vision purpose for vision purpose we do not want this pillar particularly this one and this one if there is no pillar here it was completely transparent then we have a very big angle of the vision but our vision is a secondary our primary is a safety so that if you roll over so that it will not squeeze you it will it does not kill you so this is why we have a problem in this area we cannot eliminate for aerodynamics point of view structural point of view we need to have it structural aerodynamics point of view we don't want to have it then our life could be easy and that this is one of the biggest culprit who actually causes a flow separation in this area a conical vortex and that vortex is rotating like that like a cyclone tornado and also it goes up towards the roof and also it impinges around the side window like that and so therefore it creates multiple different type of noise and that noise comes to your head through your ear you are perceiving that noise uh, at high speed and you cannot hear any other noise except that one so therefore all car company in the world they are trying to reduce that noise so my phd was on this the how we can if we cannot eliminate what should be our curvature what should be our curvature that when our minimum level of noise we can generate that's the thing so i'll be talking about that things tomorrow but so the biggest causes of the noise in the car is the a pillar and then outside rear view mirrors i talked about yesterday remember the adjustment the gap of different people height we need to do that gap uh, windshield wiper wiper is here to clean the window here uh, and then radio antenna we solved that problem roof racks we did not the door there is some gap on the door and the side window systems side window system it means that our unfortunately they in this area it is not absolutely flat because there is a little bit of recess so when the wind is going over it they also create a little local separation and that also generate sound so these are the things we are talking and hatch roof on the top but not it is not on the all vehicles so it is not a uh, oring thing so now and now have a look this is the pillar vortex you cannot see very well this one i am talking about that this is a little bit of flow separation here and that flow separation how it look like and that is the magnitude look at there how it is rotating if you look from here you can see very nicely particularly if you are in the wind tunnel if you are in the wind tunnel and if you if you look from from this side from the top side from this side you can clearly see a little conical vortex is going like a tornado and that vortex when it is going like that because it is not a very steady it is a very unsteady so it actually also pushes on the window and when you can so when you drive at high speed on the highway freeway and then you can put your hand when you drive 100 km per hour i i request you all when you are driving your car just put your hand on the side on the wall just for a few second or particularly if you are not driving someone else driving you hold it and you will find that a lot of vibration is coming up the wind and it is because who is causing it this culprit and we call it a pillar vortex and it create a huge noise 
The next one, ah, okay. So if you chop it here, if you cut it here, and you look at from the back side view, from the top view, and you can see that by nice picture. You see how the flow is rotating there? So these things, uh, I, I, I'll try to see some flow visualization with the smoke if I have, I'll show you tomorrow. At least otherwise I'll show you with the, with the ultra at high speed at 140 kilometer per hour, 130 kilometer per hour, 120 kilometer per hour, how it looks like. Okay? That's the things I'll show you tomorrow. So now, how we evaluate the noise? Three different methods. Three different methods. One method is called analytical method. is a mathematical equation you need to solve. But those equations are highly nonlinear. Highly nonlinear. If you try to solve mathematically, your life will be very, very tired solving those. But one gentleman, he came to help us. And his name is Sir James Lighthill. Sir James Lighthill. It is called Lighthill Acoustic Analogy. Light Hill Acoustic Analogy. He was knighted by the Queen, Sir James Light Hill. And I, little man, also had an opportunity to see him in 1997 in the University of Adelaide. In it is the fourth International Congress on Sound and Vibration. He came here 1997 when I was a PhD student. And uh, my supervisor said to me at the time, I remember, Zephyros. If you want to ask any questions about the aeroacoustics, this will be your golden opportunity to ask this man because he will be there. And second thing, he is too old. You may not have opportunity next time to ask. So do not miss the opportunity. And my supervisor, Professor Simon Watkins, he was so right. 1998, he died. Trying to swim from one island to other island at, the, at his age. And then uh, during the swimming, he had a heart attack and he died. Sir James Lighthill. And I asked some questions to him. And um, actually, it was a blessing for me. From him, I learned a lot of new things from there. So that's a very important thing. So that, that, uh, Lighthill acoustic analogy is the only things Fox William and other people, they tried to explain it later. That is how, but that thing's only for jet noise. It is not for our aeroacoustic noise generated by the car. So therefore, that acoustic analogy, you cannot readily apply for our car. And at the moment, we do not, because it's acoustic, acoustic energy is, is a significantly less than the hydrodynamic pressure energy. So therefore, to differentiate with the hydrodynamic energy, hydrodynamic pressure energy, and the acoustic energy and that to computationally do whole things in a very unsteady flow therefore computational uh, method is still a little bit challenging but some people are trying uh, they are trying to uh, do this but i believe that in the future when the computational power will be more and more more capacity will come at that time it will be more and also a reliable tool but at this moment uh, it is still not a reliable tool yet so therefore, only option left, young people, for you, do experimentally. An experimental method is the only method most reliable till to date. But in the future, maybe computational method will come. I cannot tell when. So that's the uh, three methods. Uh, you already understand that the acoustic analogy or the analytical method using uh, Sir James Lighthill's analogy, and that can be used for, uh, for the jet flow, jet noise because that's the his past and he wrote two article in royal society uh, journal royal society you know it's a very well known uh, things uh, in that journal in 1951 and 52 part a part b light hill analogy you can search it in the internet uh, and you can get it if you, you cannot get these two article if anyone interested you can write to me and i will send you the pdf version of that one because i have in my in my folder all right so it is a very important uh, two articles now, the measurement tools, and we have uh, this one and the one more slides, and we stop. Uh, so, these uh, measurement tools of the noise, we use microphones, artificial head system, I already told you, but I will show you to, uh, tomorrow. Uh, this is uh, one of the schematics of the artificial head. 
this is the schematic of Ashifia head. In fact, uh, this one, I am, you see, there is a, there is a, you see the special sound generator, a single tone sound generator. And I am actually cal calibrating this microphone. I never trusted any equipment I used in my, any study. I never trusted any equipment I used. Every equipment I thoroughly cross-checked, calibrated, and then I used. And same advice I am giving to all of you. Because a lot of things can go wrong. If you are using, e experimental work takes a lot of time, set up. And if you are using a wrong equipment, faulty equipment, and after sometimes you found that your signal is not giving the right thing or at least close to what are the things you are thinking. Therefore, you young people, maybe it is too late for you. Some of you are doing masters, PhD, or some of you are doing the research, and some of you are having access to a, someone's facility. Uh, it is you, it is difficult to redo. So it is that's why I'll also sh tell you tomorrow that what are the things you need to look at apart from calibration. There are other things also, particularly acoustic signal, compared to other pressure and other things. It is very important. So and this is the microphone how I set up, and you see it's my all the drawing is my hand my hand drawing. Because at the time I was uh, not very good on the on the AutoCAD or SolidWorks, but you are all expert now, young people, and I did my hand. But I, I was talking about that things I did in 1998, 1997, long time ago. And then, so these are the things I'll be talking tomorrow: how acoustic noise we uh, measure, how we process, and then what are the things we are getting, and how the graph looks like, real graph, and all these things I'll be talking tomorrow, and also our wind tunnel measurements I'll be talking tomorrow, uh, and now. Uh, to conclude for today, uh, these are the things, few remarks I want you to carry uh, when you go out of today. One is that aerodynamic, no, uh, vehicle aerodynamics encompasses not only road vehicles, not only car, not only bus, not only track, but also there are other things. And knowledge does not matter. You, you know how to road vehicle um, aerodynamic performance you can measure, same principle, a slight modification you need to do for other things. So, you will be effective on other areas as well. Your, your, your experience, your knowledge is, is a portable. You can uh, use for other area. Uh, and then vehicle refinement it starts with a simple shape and then we go to the real complicated shape. And that also I mentioned to you, I showed you, that's how we do. And the pressure drag is overwhelming, around over 90 percent in our vehicle, in a road vehicle, except train, except train, because train is very long. As a result, its surface is very big. As so when wind is going on the surface, so when that big surface area and the little little friction, um, this uh, drag, you add them together, that is a bigger than your engine in the front. Clear? So that's why don't say that Professor Firo said all this blob body shape is the pressure drag is a maximum. No, only the train is a different. Okay, uh, and then and then vehicle add-ons. Of course, added any vehicle add-on you see, immediately you say in one word, you are your drag coefficient is bigger and you are burning more fuel. That's simple as it is. So where you don't need it, my advice is take it out. Put it in the garage somewhere. When you need it, put it back and go. And then the vehicle add-on, it not only drag but also stability problem because it has a side force will be bigger. And then other one is crossway has significant impact on directional stability and particularly when you are going close to the hill or big ramp and that you have to be very careful on that even when you are driving your car and the natural boundary layer is complex and that need to be measured more and more data as we get we can make our decision more more accurately more correctly more precise precisely and also more intelligently all these things depends on our more statistical data and with this note uh, I stop and then we'll have a I think um, few minutes break and then we'll have a little uh, interesting topic today to discuss and we'll do that one okay now do you have any question young people no you can ask me also during other session uh, so so please my request to all of you do not feel shy do not feel shy any question you have even you think the question is not a very good one but still you ask because we do not know when I will see you again. So, this is an opportunity. I already told you the story about Sir James Lighthill. I sat next to him. It's whole my memory is still in before me. I never thought that he will be dying next year. 
although my supervisor warned me I did not believe him at the time okay so these are the things all right with this note thank you I stopped and have a little short break
फूल आप लगा दीजिए और सही जाएगा ओके रोड सो वेलकम बैक टू द लास्ट सेशन ऑफ सेकेंड डे टूडे इन दिस इंटरेक्टिव सेशन विल डिस्कस अबाउट रिटी ट्रायल बिजनेस इन इंडिया एंड वी लुक हेयर द ट्राय सेफ्टी द इकोनॉमिक्स एंड इवेन द टायर एरोडाइनमिक्स डिपेंड ऑन दिस रिटरी ट्रायर बिजनेस and we will focus on the global as well as indian context so, retreating as you see that uh, prefix uh, re is there uh, retreat means remanufacturing process it indicates a remanufacturing process where the old own tires will be given a new lease of life so it will be remanufactured and it can compete with a new one so oh, retreading is applied in case of old tires at old tires after inspection inspection verification can only be allowed for retreading so any old old out tire cannot be uh, sent for retreading only after in careful inspection if the casing etc are intact <coughs> it can be sent for retreading so you see what happens in case of a new tire once you manufacture a new tire approximately 75 to 80% of the total manufacturing cost is incurred in the tire body and its casing a remaining 20 to 25% are only spent for trade so what is trade you just see a layer is applied over the tire body the outermost layer is considered as trid you see the outermost most layer is considered as trid so 20 to 25% cost is incurred here where rest of the cost is for the original car body or original car tire body so for a worn out tire if you see the maximum wear and tearing happens in case of outer portion and if the car uh, tire body remains intact then you can send this car for retreading and there are two retreading processes we will discuss one by one with their pros and cons hmm? so tread is the outermost portion which interacts with the road surface so traction etc will happens with it and that's why you will see the grooves are cut and the tire is consider the zone out when we see the depth in the groove is reduced to a certain level so there is a, a tire own indicator we'll see in later slides how we'll decide ki your tire is zone out or how a mechanic or dealer will decide ki your tire is zone out and requires replacement or replaced by a, a retreating tire so if you go for a retreat it is seen that ki the retreat tires will cost at least 40 to 50% less than a new tire so it is economically viable hmm. if you don't want to compromise the passenger safety so for your own car you decide not to go for retreading but for commercial vehicle so this is a very good economical uh, uh, proportion so uh, the most attractive thing is the cost effectiveness i am talking about even commercial vehicles you can go for retreat tires because in commercial vehicles at least six uh, tires are there in indian market each tire is sold for a commercial vehicle say it's a, a light uh, heavy vehicle or uh, say li lightweight vehicle or uh, heavy vehicles you will see uh, light commercial vehicles lcv and scv it is not less than 1 uh, 10000 rupees uh, per tire so for six tires you see 60000 uh, indian rupees so the very difficult Uh, to spend by a, 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 a small a player uh, who has a lightweight vehicle or a heavyweight vehicle and uh, market wise so it has registered a tremendous market growth because indian uh, transport sector is growing at a rate of 8% hmm? uh, 
another thing is tire retreating is environment friendly therefore government is also promoting tire retreating business hmm. otherwise you see what happens with this uh, old worn out tires uh, it has dumped it, it uh, dumped with other municipal uh, garbages and cause a lot of uh, environmental pollution not only that you see the uh, waters are accumulated in the uh, pockets of these tires and it will become a breeding ground for uh, all these pests like mosquitoes and it will become a health, health hazard hmm, uh, like malaria, dengue etc. So if you really recycle these tires, most of these tires, then you can get rid of this health hazard. So this is another aspect, you see the uh, cross section of this uh, tire. So main is thread on the outer, from, if, if you see from the outer layer to core, the main is thread is a rubbery material and a groove is cut on this thread so that you can get a very good grip attraction with the surface and as you are moving towards inner segment, you see different plies are there mm, and that is for the reinforcement and there are two types of tire, tires, one is radial tires, the very uh, 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 modern uh, you see uh, technology embedded tires and there is a bias tires. So bias tires are usually used for commercial vehicles. Mm where a little oobling uh, may not uh, disturb you, but for passenger vehicles we require a very smooth ride. So for smooth ride radial uh, uh, tire is there and this difference between radial and uh, your uh, bias tires depends on how these plies are uh, textured. So how these plies are textured based on that you can classify between uh, the radial tires as well as that uh, 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 bias tires. So uh, radial tires gives you more comfort hmm. whereas bias tires are economical for uh, uh, your commercial vehicles, goods vehicle. Hmm. So these are the side walls and you see when you buy a new tire at least you can see some of these uh, imprints on the side walls of this tire. Hmm? So one is like nominal section width, these three values are there based on that so whenever you go for a tire swap and ask for a tire. So they require at least these three numbers like nominal rim diameter, this information, so brand, uh, any brand, the manufacturer, uh, whether it is a nylon tire, uh, in which country it is made. So all these specifications are there, ISI marking, this is marking is important in India. Hmm. So all these things are written here. Hmm. Uh, at least for new tire you can see these uh, informations very prominent and I have taken a, a bias tire used for bus. And another important thing is tire retreating is possible for any diameter of tire, whether it is a small tire or large tire a large diameter tire, but tire retreating is economical for large diameter tire because for a motorcycle tire you won't go for retreating because cost is less, replacement cost is less. Hmm. So you can buy your uh, motorcycle tire. Now how to check your tire wear, how can you judge ki your tire or your mechanic will decide ki your tire is worn out, you see your worn, worn out tire and while driving in the highway you will see many of the commercial vehicles are uh, plying with this kind of uh, own. You, you, you cannot see the grooves, so grooves are not there, it, it has become flat. So a small uh, tire indicator is there inside the groove and when your tire groove touches with this small indicators, it indicates that your tire is worn out and there is a requirement for replacement whether you replace it with a retreat tire or a new tire that is your decision. In some cases this indicator is also there. So with this help of two you can decide ki whether your tire is worn out or not and depending on that you decide what to do. Now there are more than uh, 20,000 retreaters in India and this data is questionable because uh, the resources where I got this data, that there are 20,000 retailers. Uh, there are many more retailers which are in working in organi inorganized sectors. So there are some well-established laboratories 
where they follow the organized process this is one type of retailers very you see uh, organized way of retailing they do and other is small plants in working in unorganized or small scale industry setup many times you will see in a roadside especially in the highways hmm, some retailers are there so they do uh, by their own experience they uh, do, uh, do, uh, didn't get any formal uh, uh, training to retreat hmm, they learn from their bosses hmm. so uh, this uh, two types of things are there so 20000 uh, organized uh, uh, as well as unorganized there but i believe that ki india is such a big country more than uh, 20000 organized unorganized uh, retreaters are there it may be 50000 because there is no data for that now there are two types of uh, retreading so retreading is uh, a multi step process so several steps are there so first we will discuss with the conventional process the conventional process is also known as mold cure or hot cure process so whether you go for conventional process or pressure process uh, first two steps are same like whether your tire is fit for retreading or not so that can be judged by inspection so inspection process is same for both these techniques and then buffing so buffing process has little difference buffing means you have to cut you see the worn out tire so you have to cut or peel off the rubbery portion of this tire so you can see this rubbery portion of the tire so you need to peel off some thicknesses of the tire so that is known as buffing process so buffing process is more or less same a little difference is there for uh, both the types of retreading namely conventional process as well as pressure process and after buffing what will happen in case of conventional process you see new tread is glued onto the tire hmm? you see it, the 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 tread is there inside a rim uh, over a rim new tread is there and by rolling process you can just attach the tread in the buff tire hmm? after peeling of the tire you just roll over it and after rolling over this rubber strip you see what will happen you have to put it in a individual chamber individual chamber and then go for vulcanization what is vulcanization of rubber vulcanization rubber is adding sulfur to it sulfur vapor to it and by adding sulfur vapor and at a certain temperature the sulfur sulfur will help the rubber to become more stronger as well as more elastic so this property addition uh, can be done only by addition of sulfur at a certain temperature so if you have number of tires say 10 tires so you require 10 individual chambers hmm, to uh, for vulcanization and that's why you will see only small scale tire retreaders maybe uh, road side tire retreaders they can go for this conventional mold cure retreading process but for big tire retreaders and there are big companies involved we'll talk about it so they cannot afford this because this is not very cost effective for them so for their case so they put number of tires in a autoclave you see what they do <coughs> they take the uncured rubber so this is known as cushion or uh, bonding gum and they put this rubber uh, of a thin layer of rubber and keep it under press so it is a press and they keep it uh, under press for some time maybe for few hours and after that they go for the autoclave process in the autoclave process they apply heat pressure in the autoclave a certain amount of pressure certain amount of heat so you can search literature to find out the values of heat so here what they do they apply pressure and here heat is not more because the attachment of that additional tread what you are going to put on the uh, tire body so that is done mainly due to pressure so here you need not heat it much so therefore this is known as pre cure or cold cure process 
So, if you see one data shows that ki Indian tire retailers opt both the process 50 50 percent. So, it is there is no clear trend that ki Indian tire retailers follow one process over other, but it is seen that the big players those who have international tie ups they prefer this uh, pressure process because this pressure process ensures uh, tire retreating in bulk quantity. So, obviously, big player will uh, prefer bulk quantity. And another thing is that the retreading is primarily done for commercial vehicles like trucks and buses. And if you go for pressure process, so you can retreat your tire up to three times. But it is seen that in India, average truck bus tire is retreated up to 1.5 times. So, if you have two tires, you can retreat it up to three times. Now, I have listed the advantages of these two process. Conventional process, which is followed by our uh, uh, small scale retreaders, this is quite economical and that is why they can set up a plant and they can offer us retreaters at less cost. Okay. It requires less investment and third one is tire aesthetics will be better if you see tire from side because after retreating you cannot see, but the side walls of the tire can be seen. Hmm. If you see a side view of the car, the side walls of the car, uh, the side walls of the tire will be seen. So, they put veneers, veneers into it and the retreated tire would look like uh, almost new one. Hmm. So, that is why uh, these are the advantages of conventional process mainly adopted by small tire retreaders. And what is the advantage of pressure process? So, the advantage of pressure process is the retreated tire which is cured by pressure process, it gives more mileage. Why? Because you will use richer rubber means the richer rubber compound, the trade will be denser because you are applying immense pressure and you will get more flatter profile because of this immense pressure. But you cannot apply this pressure process for bias type of tires. It is best suitable for radial tires. And another catch is radial tires are not preferred by many uh, commercial vehicles because these are very costly, but that can be offset if you, uh, you can use uh, radial tires for uh, long period of time. So, that will offset your higher cost and the next advantage of pressure process tire is you will have longer casing life because they are amount of heat in the autoclave will be less as compared to your conventional mold process. So, therefore, your casing the main casing which is you can see the core of your tire. So, that will not be distorted. So, you will get a longer casing life and because of this pressure process you can ensure a uniform trade thickness. Therefore, you will get better balancing and another is you will also get better traction with the road surface because uh, here buffing process is a bit different, a more sophisticated and therefore, you will get more flatter profile. In case of uh, conventional process, uh, buffing is done uh, manually or using semi automatic process. Here buffing is done uh, fully automatic. Hmm. Some photographs are there in the website, the different websites I will share some and you can see the sequence of photographs which will give you an idea and a difference of these two processes. Now, the question comes, we always prefer new goods, be it shoes, jackets, uh, shirts, anything. The question comes to our mind is, is tire retreading good? Can you adapt? For your information, tire retreading industry supplies retreated tires for ambulances, retreated tires for aeroplanes, retreated tires for military vehicles. So, there must not be any question comes to your mind that retreating tire is 
uh, not good, but the process of repeating must be important. If a process of retreating is not good, if small scale retreaters and even big scale retreaters do not follow the rules and regulations and standards, then your retreating retreated tires will be uh, not up to the mark. So, as you see, the tire retreating cost only 20 to 25 percent of the retreaters and it provides mileage up to 70 percent as compared to the new tire. If your road condition and load condition is good, so that is a difficult condition in India because people are tempted, especially the commercial uh, manufacturer, they are tempted of uh, overloading. If the load as proper roads are good, then you can go for two to three times of uh, retreading hmm, before you uh, send the tire for a scrap. Uh, as I told you, the process of retreading is equally important. It is uh, whether you get a good road or load condition, process of retreading is also an important. Tire retreading can be done for all kinds of tire sizes, but it depends on economics. A bigger tire, uh, you can go for retreading. For smaller tire, you will not go for retreading. Another is pre cured tread rubber. So, this is, uh, this is done for commercial vehicles. Mm, like for trucks and buses, the pre cured tree driver here, uh, vulcanizations are not uh, applied uh, before. And what are the advantages or limitations? Retreats are quite safe, highly environment friendly, enhance tires life definitely, and it promotes recycling. So, in the age where we are all thinking of the environmental uh, co uh, considerations, so it promotes retreating, promotes recycling. So, retreating is now become a part of our life and the limitation is that I found that Chinese make budget tires. They have started uh, flooding Indian market uh, just before uh, COVID period and sometimes these budget tires becomes less expensive than the retreated one and we all follow the, uh, we all uh, have an inclination towards buying new things. So, uh, the mostly the uh, small scale retailers, they are facing a difficulty because people, especially the commercial uh, vehicle owners, they prefer the budget tires over the retreated ones. Uh, and another is poor quality of the retreated tires because small scale uh, retailers, they uh, do not uh, sometimes ensure the uh, retreated tire quality. Hmm, no quality inspection is there, not at the governmental level. Now, uh, you see the thing like rules, rules are there and what is the ground reality. So, this information I have already told you, if a truck tire cost over 10,000 rupees and if 6 tires are used for a uh, say uh, light uh, commercial vehicle and you need to spend uh, 60,000 rupees at a time. So, it is better to go for retreat, but retreading is not uh, very effective for non-radial tires, uh, for radial tires. So, for non-radial tires, you go for retreading. Non-radial tires are used for commercial vehicle segment. So, retreat must be rejected by the, must be rejected, you see. So, this, the regulation says that the retreat must be rejected by the retreaders if there are any cuts or mild damage or deformation on the side walls after retreading, but they do not do. They just sell it. In India, vehicles are free to use resold or retreat tires, so there are no uh, barrier you can use. And government in the last month they introduced a policy where they uh, promotes the retreating for the first time, as long as the condition of the unit as a whole. The unit means the tire unit as a whole is good, means their grooves etc are proper. You can use resold tire. Most buses, but most buses run with patchwork on tire they do not go for full retreating even for a conventional mold. They approach to a trader, uh, small retreating uh, retreaders and they say just do some patchwork. Hmm. So, that from outside the vehicle inspector or the traffic police they cannot identify because you see if you see this condition. So, anybody can uh, identify, he catch this vehicle. Hmm. book the uh, them and uh, uh, apply a heavy penalty. 
so just do some patchwork but patchwork patchwork will not work you have to adopt any of these two process so this is what is going on ground hmm. and we have also experienced like you have also seen ki many school buses school vans they sometimes uh, meet unfortunate accident hmm, while carrying the uh, school kids hmm. so small patchwork on tires is unsafe and it is illegal in just last month uh, government of india they adopted the new extended producer responsibility epr this epr was introduced for the first time for west tier policy and their government of india has made retreating as an integral part of this policy but what is the ground reality will decide the challenges with uh, uh, challenges with the indian retreating business a little later in the last slide uh, before that see the global and india tier retreating potential so retreat tier business is really a very encouraging globally you see it is close to uh, uh, it was close to uh, 10 billions in 2007 and it is increasing uh, towards uh, 12 billions by the end of this year and if you see the indian retreating industry volume so it is up to uh, 1 billion us dollar and uh, roughly 2000 retreaters are scattered in both organized and unorganized sector but these data are contested somebody said it may be up to 50000 so a survey is required for that that tier retreating industry for the commercial vehicle segment is paused for growth in india fueled by the increase of number of vehicles rising tier cost and advent of radial tiers better roads and introduction of multi axle heavy duty vehicles so uh, because of this reasons uh, tier retreating uh, business is uh, very attractive in india nowadays every commercial tier manufacturer in india therefore is in the tier retreating business and in nepal hardly any vehicle owners buy new tires the uh, the the nepalese commercial vehicle owners they heavily rely on retreating tires hmm? uh, and you see india's west tier accounts about 6 to 7 percent of the total global value with the local tier industry growing at 12 percent per annum it is quite uh, uh, large even higher than our gdp growth west volumes are also rising so the, here is a concern since west volumes are rising so india has been recycle india has to recycle and reuse west tier and india has been doing it for decades although it is estimated that 60% of, of the uh waste tires are disposed through illegal dumping so there must be a, a proper disposal uh, policy but 60% of the total uh, out of life tire so they are disposed illegally and if you see the organized tire retreating business these are Uh, based on large in southern part of india and you see some of the companies like elgi indag mrf sundaram industries annamalai tire retreating corporation and stain stars these are the major players in tire retreating business and you know ki okay, some of these companies they also uh, manufacture new tires now advantage of tire retreating is and wonder friendly if you retreat tires so it will not be dumped as a land filling because once you use tire for land filling the chemical leaching will be there and lot of uh, poisonous con contaminants will be mixed with the ground and it will also uh, uh, cause harm to your uh, uh, sweet water aquifer it will be a uh, Uh, it will it will create a home for uh, 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 for mosquitoes and all those uh, pests and sometimes tire may create fire hazard because what is tire tire is nothing but a petrochemical product hmm. so you cannot uh, just uh, uh, reject your tires and dump it anywhere next is 
you can reduce CO2 emission if you go for tire retreading and track tires can be retreaded up to 2 to 3 times. Therefore, you can save 3 times the resource energy which is required otherwise to produce new tires. Hmm. So, therefore, you are not only reducing waste, but you are also saving carbon emission. Next is oil, tire is a petrochemical product. So, by chemical uh, process, uh, it takes 26 gallons of oil to manufacture one new tractor. A tractor is big, so 26 gallons of oil is required and most of this oil is found in the casing. So, casing requires most of these oils which is used in the retreading process. As a result, it takes only 7 gallons of oil to produce a retreat. The only uh, fuel which is required to make your uh, rubber. So, in this way, you are also using less amount of petroleum products. So, world produces 12 million tires per year. So, if you, if you, if you go for retreading, so, you can save 100 percent retreating, you can save 720 million liter of crude oil. You see, so average 60 liters per hour uh, uh, per tire, considering 60 liters of uh, oil required for power, a huge, huge uh, amount of crude oil you can reduce. So, uh, that is the thing, and another is retreat tire requires only 25 percent of natural rubber. Hmm? Whereas, every new tires requires 80 percent of the natural rubber and the rubber forest plantations are gradually reducing natural rubber plantations. So, it is they are in as uh, the southeast Asian countries mostly. So, because of deforestations, so natural rubber price is increased a lot. So, if you go for retreating, so your dependency of natural rubber will be reduced. Now, I want to talk about a story. I want to tell you a story. You see this man, here is uh, K. M. Mammen Mapillai. So, he used to sell toy balloons uh, in 1946 from a small manufacturing unit in Tamil Nadu. And his turning point came in 1952 when he noticed a foreign company that foreign company was supplying treat rubber to a tire retreating plant. So, something clicked in his mind because he was dealing with uh, balloons. So, balloon is also a rubber product, they knew about the rubber. So, he started a manufacturing treated rubber unit in India and named after uh, named as Madras Rubber Factory MRF. It became big success as it was during that time was only Indian company to do retreading uh, tire and subsequently gained 50 percent market share in the 4 years since its inception due to high quality product. Then in 1960, Mapillai decided to enter into tire manufacturing. Till that, that was B2B uh, uh, company and after that he decided to go for a full manufacturing plant to manufacture brand new tire and he hired a um, person who, refine, uh, who redefined the Indian advertising era his name was Alec Padamsi. So, had Alec Padamsi and Alec Padamsi and his team, he designed this logo known as MRF Muscle Man. Hmm? I think you are familiar with this logo and this logo was once imprinted in the cricket bats of Virat Kohli and Sachin Tendulkar. MRF has a cricket academy in Chennai and they um, uh, produces fast bowlers. Dennis Lilly was once the chief coach of that MRF cricket academy. So, with help of that Indian ad guru Alec Padamsi, both were no uh, more. So, they started branding of Indian tire manufacturer MRF and then they have overtaken the market which was 
at that time dominated by multinationals such as Dunlop, Firestone and Goodyear. He started targeting the replacement demand segment that is when a tire is changed by the retailer they choose MRF as a replacement. So nowadays if you find two or three commercial tire shops in your city at least two of them will be MRF and all these tire shops will keep MRF tire. He found that he studied the psychologies of truck drivers, uh, truck drivers and truck owners and found that uh, truck drivers look for strong and powerful tires. So they built the identity of MRF tires to be some using MRF muscle man and in 1964. In 1973, MRF becomes India's first company to manufacture and market nylon passenger car tires commercially. Today, the turnover of MRF company is nearly US dollar 3 billion. So you see the gentleman who is no more, he started his company by using tire retaining business and finally he uh, made up a MRF, uh, a company of about 3 billion. And I have heard sometimes that the, those who purchased MRF shares 30 years ago, they have become millionaire now, nowadays. So this is the story of uh, MRF and this story, what, why I told you this story, uh, not because of ad campaigning, this is because the growth of MRF, the development of MRF was associated with the tire retreating. So these are the challenges of India and tire. So I have noted it and after this slide we will start deliberations based on this point. So what I found that there is a lack of organizations hmm, among the tire retailers. Some startups are now working, one Jaipur based startup, they have connected 100 uh, tire retailing companies under one umbrella and if you want to buy a retreat tire, so they will arrange uh, within few hours because they are connected with 100 tire retreaters in the downstream. So still lack of organization is there because you see that tire retreaters are between 20,000 to 50,000. Next is lack of safety concern. This leads to accidents especially I am talking about the safety concerns inside the factory where tire retreating is done, especially during the pyrolysis sector of the end of tire recycling. Means when you cannot go for tire retreating, uh, end of tire, so you need to go for pyrolysis to take out those valuable things like oil etc. So there is a lack of safety concerns. So uh, this is the area where you look into and that is lack of EPR. EPR is um, uh, in force in the last month, but lack of information is still there. And there is every uh, till last month, uh, before last month, uh, in every state there are different regulations, and that's why you will see this tire retaining businesses are uh, uh, focused only in. 5 6 states in india only i am talking about the organized tire retreating businesses fails to introduce technology by small retailers small retailers are not interested to uh, inv invest money for new technology hmm. then fails to maintain high standards of retreating sometimes after retreating they don't go for uh, quality inspection so quality inspection for small retailers are totally absent fails to follow the regulation, BS, BIS, either Bharat standard, ISI, these codes are completely missing. So uh, this needs to be uh, worked out. And smaller unit, this faces threat due to low cost are imported from China. Hmm. So these are the challenges of India and tire retreating and recycling industry. So this is the presentation from my side. I request Professor Firoj to conduct the a uh, brainstorming session on tire retreating.
all right uh, let's go to a start <coughs> it's a very interesting area um, interesting area not only for financial point of view but also for safety point of view and also local employment because the people those who are involved with this business on the roadside or near roadside they are also employ people um, and um, so therefore this topic we want to discuss with you today and share your views how we can improve this sector both in terms of our engineering knowledge because we are all predominantly engineers and uh, coming from science background and other thing is what are the things you think that can be done so that these people those are working on those um, small shops so that their knowledge level can be a little bit enhanced so that quality things can be improved okay so that is our main purpose all right so floor is now open so any one of you yes you want to say something yes young man please uh, give this young man uh, microphone microphone respected sir i am himanshu singh yes sir retrads are quite safe and are being used in all kind of vehicle now like buses trucks cars there are many econo economical benefits of retreading as the retreading tires and less pricey in comparison of new ones that definitely help us to save considerable amount of money but sir ma my question is that is retreads are quite safe or not because it is remanufactured even if it will not save it is major cause of accident it is also a bug of safety features retreads process is not responsible for separating large chunk of rubber on the road and highways according to recent studies it happen abuse like tire failure cause by road hazards tire blast and overloading sir so it is safe to remanufacture used tire very good question in my knowledge any tire to be retreated first it need to look at that it its basic structure is absolutely safe or not and there are some standard there are some standard methodology that need to be checked first and after that when the surface is retreated or put the new thread um, as far as i know in australian context our australian standard is exactly the same standard for new tire and the retreated tire there is no small iota is the deviation from there because retreated tire need to go through stringent test procedures as the new tire want to sell in the australian market and the company those who are manufacturing in australia particularly they are predominantly are the tire manufacturer themselves so it is easier for australian regulatory authority to uh, check the compliance because the tire company those who have the market they do not want to lose their business altogether in australian market because uh, you many of you don't know in australian market in australian regulatory authorities they do not give mercy to anyone and the and the non compliance of the standard is so so stringent and the tire company will be at least 50 60 100 million dollar fine and they cannot recover from it so that's why in the first stage they try their best to do everything as per the standard this is the i think the problem in our part of the world because the people those who are doing this retreading they also do not have the right knowledge and about the safety and also we do not have the people those who can actually help them because these people many of them not only they do these things not correctly because it is i personally believe that there is a significant knowledge gap so if we if we 
can organize a short training program for them not to not to ask them to pay any money rather the people those who are doing in this workshop if we can organize that okay you are attending this workshop or that attending the training program we will also pay you money you don't not only you don't need to pay anything rather when you will be coming so that you you will lose some hour at your workshop so you will be losing some money we will provide that money to you and you will find that after that a significant responsibility will go up because nobody wants to do something and to using that ob that um, things or that tire or other thing other people have accident no nobody wants nobody wants their product to use someone to be killed by using that it is purely lack of knowledge and of course let give little bit of financial help to them in different form so that they can also use modern technology modern equipment not free give them a little bit lay, less um, interested maybe little bit small section the state can carry or the government or the federal government central government can carry uh, pay and then this go, this people will buy the equipment because sometimes these equipments are also expensive too and many of these companies they are living from hand to mouth so these are the way we can help them to come back and we engineer we have a huge responsibility to help them with our knowledge that these are things need to be done and this is the how you will be doing from your con context but we cannot ban them we cannot jail them that will not solve our problem it will be then going to hidden or hiding they will do from somewhere and that will not solve our problem because many of our truck bus and other operator they do not make a lot of money they are living very thin margin because they also don't want their truck or bus to have an accident and completely written off so if we can show them there is a financial model if you use a very high quality retreat tire which ensures your safety your vehicle safety and also the people those who are selling it their profit margin is they are little bit ensured and the quality and standard ensured everyone every stakeholder will be benefited that is my perception but i am in no way to ban this business because it will not solve our real problem okay any other people yes please give him a come good afternoon my name is manu kumar thakur from iri hyderabad so uh, as already sir told that the our uh, yesterday that the india is the largest pro uh, production of the tractors so sir according to my knowledge uh, like the people uh, in the village use the mostly the tractors at that time there is a no need of that much safety and that much th th because they are uh, means uh, working slowly they are not moving they at the high off speeds off. Yes. Mm -hmm. they are not moving at the high speeds so there is not requirement of that much safety so if we convince the farmer uh, like uh, who use this uh, retreat tires that um, so uh, and many of the problem occurs when the like uh, already the like mrf tire most people think that oh go to original company we use the original why to use the retreat tire but according to my like one of the companies there in the punjab they convince the farmer go to the villages uh, one by one and that convince the farmer to use the retreat tire because this is one of the biggest company i think in the punjab they they use the retreat tire so uh, for uh, my knowledge if we go to each and every farmer of the our all indians village it will be good for our uh, economy and uh, less pollution also i entirely agree because many of our, many of our farmers or those that are using the tractor or some other um, small scale company or uh, local tradesman they are carrying product from one location to other location it is a lot of thing is ignorance because they do not know the where actually they need to go how they can do it how safely they can do it how how economically they can do it so all this information if we can provide them correctly then many of these people will come forward to use it and that is another important things we need to work hand in hand as a team 
because as our you see that uh, professor uh, akshay mentioned about the low cost chinese product is coming here now imagine they made this tire in china they brought it by ship or by somehow brought it of course not by plane and then they paid also maybe some customs as well and then they are selling the people those who are marketing it of course not the chinese people our indian people are marketing it the people those who are shop they are selling it so they also get some a uh, small share of the profit as well right from you and then still you are paying less than our own manufactured tire in in india so here we need to think a chinese company they can product far far away not in within their own country with paying all this extra overhead cost and still it is cheaper compared to our there are something we also need to think very carefully that our own tire also need to manufacture such a way so that at least price can it will go down and our 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 tire will be competitive that is another point also we need to think about we always need to do a lot of research we should not do that one product we did and our next 50 100 years we will be manufacturing it and we will be selling it no that beautiful time already gone it is not any more exist in this world we need to introduce continuously the better manufacturing process in every process we need to reduce the cost so that our our customers our users they can get the some benefit as well because otherwise we cannot stop the chinese or maybe some other or maybe bangladesh will start up a few few years sell it our australian market then how can we stop for example chinese tire is still coming through the upper border from bangladesh it will coming with the through through the rice field you cannot stop it i am giving an example so our tire our home grown manufacturers they need to find that if that company is doing we need to study that company how they are doing it and then we will see whether we can replicate that process with our local uh, local contextualization in in india that's how you need to approach it is my my thinking i will be doing that okay any other question yes please so good morning good afternoon sir my name is jinan kumar sau from irt prayagraj so my question is if retreating is such a strong method so does uh, aircraft so uh, use uh, retreating method because the tire in used in aircraft has to face a uh, uh, lots of wear and tear so this method is successful in aircraft or the process used in the uh, of retreating method is same for air aircraft also now um, as far as i as, as far as i know from my study when i was a uh, undergraduate masters and phd uh, not phd masters and undergraduate the tire the tire construction slightly different for the aircraft tire it is not exactly the same process here because aircraft tire when the first time for the aircraft the will there is a huge vertical force also acting on it but our most tire vertical axis uh, on the on the road vehicle it is constant almost and and at that time it is not only face the vertical force but also the rolling resistance when it goes there so that's why very often you will see there is a lot of smoke is coming in there uh, and also this the tire construction the how the load will be distributed vertical force and the horizontal force uh, it is uh, different so that's why in aircraft generally generally and their their tire life is very shortened aircraft tire uh, life is calculated based on how many landing it has done that's right so that based on the landing so as a result uh, in many cases they generally do not allow uh, to use the retreated tire they are because the life is very short and also huge heat problem and this is one of the reason why in the landing gear we do not use um, the any any air we use nitrogen pure nitrogen as a, as as a as a uh, gas and of course with the we have a fluid so that no reaction due to the landing happens because we don't use air because air contain oxygen so these are the things in aircraft but if the technology permits and it is safe 
then I don't see any problem in the future. That is my my thinking. Okay. It it may not, we don't know exactly. There is no independent study available on the whether it will create pollution or it will less create. We don't have any study. In my knowledge, no. But there is a another thing we need to study. We need to study. But remember, uh, there, there are many many times due to the bad landing, sometimes tire also burst of the aircraft. And on the road, tire usually burst based on predominantly due to poor maintenance and poor not looking after. Where you need to not to use the tire, still you are using it. Okay. And generally, as a rule of thumb, uh, normal our uh, passenger car tire. It should um, it should it should have the right thread because in Australia five millimeter is the thickness of the thread. If uh, uh, not thickness, the height or thickness you can say. So if it is less than five millimeter, you can actually measure with the ruler. If you have a car and you see that your thread is less than five millimeter, you don't use it. You use other one or vulcanize or or maybe retain it. Okay. So for example, I recently changed my tire or my all four. Some tire little bit less, and remember, in the tire, in the front wheel, it is not exactly horizontal. It is little bit angle with the camber. So therefore, which side is facing more the road surface? That side will wear out more. That's why you need to rotate the wheel very often, so that equally wear out both sides of the tire. So this is, I believe, that you, many of you, all, all of you are engineers. So you need to take into account uh, yourself when you use the tire. And same knowledge you can transfer. You can share with the people, track, uh, track uh, fleet owner or the track driver. You can say, look, it is safe for you. Need to look that do this thing so it is it will be safe for you too, and safe for the people those are using the road. Any other question? Yes, please. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Nikita from SJCIT, Karnataka. So my question is, how these retreating tires are compared to normal or fresh tires in, in terms of safety and stability? Because as we know, these may not have high quality when compared to the new tires. And this may also increase the weight to the tires which may unbalance the wheel. So how can they compare? Very good question. Very good question. This is why, this is why the tire when you retreat, the usually the company or the people, those who are doing it, they are highly trained highly trained all are coming from science and engineering with the knowledge not maybe not bachelor degree but at least diploma or other people those who are actually doing the work and they always check with all the equipment modern equipment that the tire base on the all these things are still intact because you remember there is a lot of plies with the different type of thread and other things and also there is some still still wire as well and that gives you the lateral stability and so on so they look at everything with the sophisticated machine and when they see that tire is a healthy and it does not have any defect of the main structures and then that one they put a mark we will go for take out the uh, initial surface with the uneven surface and all these things which uh, Dr. Raksha showed you and then it goes to the machine but usually uh, I saw in Australia that uh, that retreating it is almost hu without human intervention. It is doing almost like a new new tire, like the same process as a new tire, and go through the same automatic computerized system. They look at everything. They look at the imbalance. You know the certain imbalance you cannot uh, allow, and certain certain imbalance you can allow so that when the tire is fitted, they will be balancing it with the special uh, weight. They put a different location. Otherwise, your tire will be uneven, uneven um, wear and tear. And also, it will create your suspension, use the vibration, and and the steering. You will not feel very good. And I am saying you from my own experience as well. So when I drive, I feel when I drive the car, that car is a little bit vibrating. I always look at my suspension first and tire health. And if when I still fi cannot find it out, then I take the car immediately, without even asking second question, to the tire balance, the wheel balance. And all or four wheel, I'll be balancing together, including my spare balance, uh, spare one. If I did not balance it before, okay. So this is very important, young lady. It is very important that the person who will be doing this, that person need to check thoroughly because in Australia, as I said, 
the standard the same standard we apply for retreated tire and the brand new tire it means the brand new uh, the retreated tire will be as reliable as the brand new tire okay No other question? Oh, yeah, this young man, please. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, recently, sir, mentioned in their presentation that uh, we are using 6 liter of crude oil for manufacturing of one tire. Sir, we know that the crude oil or petroleum is in very limited sources. So, in the future, we certain uh, on certain time, we have to limit or maybe stop manufacturing of tire. On that time, what is the option of replacing of tire and uh, we are replacing petrol sir by uh, we as we know we are replacing petrol engines or diesel engines with uh, electric electric vehicles is is there any option with repla replacing tires and sir one more question is recently i study somewhere that uh, uae government or kingdom collecting collecting waste tire from all over the world so i don't know why he is collecting the tires now there are two things when you collect the tire, tire has contained a lot of uh, your uh, hydrocarbon and uh, many countries even including Australia, we are not allowed tire to throw anywhere. Tire, there is a company, uh, they usually buy the, all this old tire uh, which is uh, and that tire even tire is not allowed to put in the rubbish bin in Australia. You have to put because it is a very uh, valuable thing and uh, you can you can recover a lot of energy through pyrolysis and other process there are different things and the tire biggest problem is that that's the one we do in developed country but in uh, many uh, european country as uh, from there they although want to have the same process like like australia or america or canada but many of this tire uh, unfortunately goes to africa and they reuse it again because uh, many people there are unfortunately not very aware that those tire is now uh, ineligible or not safe anymore to use it. So that is the things they are doing. So this is why uh, in Europe also they are trying to somehow because it is a safe, unsafe thing. So they try to do the same process like here. So many car company even encourage them to sell to them or to put, uh, they allow the free location where they can actually put the tire and from there all the um, the uh, this company those who are recycling recycling it means they are recovering the energy from it and you saw that uh, uh, professor Raksha when he sh showed you showed you you saw that a, a very good amount of um, the energy you can get it back from the tire and the most important problem is the tire as it has a little gap little well so and our in Indian subcontinent is a very rain prone country rain prone area so the water can be stuck there and in that water sun can sunlight can fall and uh, mosquito a mosquito can lay down egg and mosquito egg will only be become the mosquito if the sunlight is there if the sunlight will not fall it is dark and no sunlight no heat activities the mosquito will not be activated there it will not germinate so therefore uh, there is a very nice breed, breeding ground for a mosquito which carries a lot of you know uh, the problem or uh, the disease and that uh, that can be about so this is why in australia they don't allow even to throw the tire on the roadside or anywhere if they can find that someone actually throws it or leave it when they suppose not to it's a huge fine huge fine not is a one or ten or ten dollar it's a huge so that people will never do it again Hello sir, myself Tanish Prakash. Uh, sir, as you have said that uh, retreated tyres are as reliable as the new tyres. So sir, why is the need of producing new tyres? Should it not bring down to zero? Very good question. Because some of the, even the retreat tyre is ex exactly as good as the brand new tyre. Our buyer perception still is there that we retreat tire is a little bit inferior quality, even in Australia. <coughs> in our Australian standard, the new tire and the retreated tire is the same. But when they tell me 
that okay professor firoz do you want to buy the tire tar i will be thinking two times will i buy it or not that is another perception problem as well so therefore many top level tire manufacturers they do not invest a lot of money in the retreater company because they know that they when they make this very good quality it means almost brand almost known exactly brand new but still they cannot get that profit margin what they usually get from the from the um, the new one and that is a yes they can make money if they can sell big number a big quantity then they can make it money but at the moment this uh, also perception problem as well so, this is the end of the session. Oh, i think one one young man wants to ask yes please yeah sir, my name is good afternoon sir my name is shravan uh, sir i have a question uh, that uh, in one slide sir has shown the tire specification so one specification is the speed limit so how the tire manufacturing industry uh, means uh, uh, shows the speed limit means that is the maximum speed limit how ensure uh, that is speed limit and uh, is it, it is expected that at the, at the higher speed uh, means wear of uh, wear of the thread will be more so is it the reason or some other reason is there okay so you know that um, in australia i i little bit surprised the tire i i saw the schematics that tire has at least at least 75% less information than an australian tire in australian tire we have significantly more information and each of this letter number indicates what type of things you can use it and you know that when uh, it is not it is not a very ideal thing when wheel is rotating when you are driving the car or a truck and to measure the your pressure it is not a good you need to measure the pressure when it is a cold it means your tire already cool down so therefore all this tire when it is rolling it creates a heat and therefore the tire need to be tested at a certain amount of heat generally maximum amount of heat a potentially can be so based on that they decide that what is the heat rating will be on this tire and also they uh, look at the road surface because in australia or america or canada all the european country and other country developed country the road surface on the road in, the, in the, our municipality road surface or on the freeway there is a standard the what sort of grading will be on the road surface because based on the road surface your friction coefficient will be different and that also will have a rolling resistance will be a free, uh, and other things and heat generation so this is why all information need to compile together because when the tire manufacturer they do they also ask the australian uh, road safety authority they okay wh what is your road standard what is your road uh, condition your municipal road, con road condition uh, that's why when you go to australia it doesn't matter where you go you are in brisbane or you are in melbourne is almost um, one and a half thousand eighteen hundred kilometer apart but all uh, or you go very countryside where only 200 100 people live all the road surface exactly the same exactly the same there is no difference whatsoever so therefore for tire, co uh, tire company it is much easier they also know the road condition surface condition and they also comply with the law so everyone is responsible we need to work hand in hand it is not that road surface i want i make one things and there because in in australia road surface those who are lay lay down the surface they are also a special training with three years predominantly diploma engineer so the diploma engineer or the we call trades people they are actually laying the floor not the person you bring from the street and show one or two times and he's doing it or she's doing it that is not the quality quality and the compliance will come when a person knows the equipped with the knowledge that person will not do the bad thing and that is the reason so all this number if something wrong on the road data then the tire company will say it is not my problem you provide the government I mean the authority not government authority because government comes and goes that it doesn't matter today one government after five years another government so government is not our concern our concern is the rules that actually developed and the law and the standard 
and standard is modified by the people like you, those who are having knowledge in this area, research, data from other country also we sometimes take and we compile all of them and they are all people are scientific knowledge and we modify the standard based on that. And I will also share a little knowledge uh, that how we, op uh, how we change the train, good train operation system in Australia, the standard. I will share that knowledge tomorrow with you.